are getting close. Uh, if council members that are here, if you could turn your cameras on so I know you're available. Thank you. for okay I'm sure Vice Mayor Bruner will come in um, we'll go ahead and get started and I will call the meeting to I will call the meeting to order good afternoon welcome to our 1230 session of the June 8th 2021 meeting council I have a few announcements and then we we will move on to our meeting Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. Just to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on and using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comments, press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins. Here. Calentari Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Golder. Here. Vice Mayor Bruner is currently absent, um, and Mayor Myers. I'm here. Okay, our first item today is a presentation. Um, we are pleased to have the Hans Christian Anderson Awards. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to. Um, Hang on one second. We are pleased to have a special presentation of the Santa Cruz City Cities Committee Hans Christian Anderson Writing Awards. This is a wonderful writing competition for children, teens, and adults sponsored by the Sister Cities Committee. I am pleased to introduce Douglas Hall, who is chair of the City Sister Cities Committee, along with Isabel Tunsert, chair of the subcommittee of the Sister City of Sestre Levante. Welcome, Doug and and Isabel, good to see you again. And I'm going to over to Doug now. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, our Santa Cruz Sister Cities, hence Christian Anderson essay competition is presented by uh, the hence Christian Anderson Fables Bay competition organized by um, Sestri Levante, our beautiful sister city in uh, Italy. It's um, Christian Anderson used to live there, and he's a favorite son. This is now the 54th edition of this contest, which is also inscribed within a larger um, celebration of um, youth and children. Uh, it's this 54th edition and one of the largest writing contests in Italy. This year, 3,500 submissions were received. 
the competition um, open to uh, children in four and, and adults in four age groups. Three are focused on youth, and one is for young adults and adults. The essays can be about any subject, but must be uh, written in folktale or fairy tale form. And a committee of readers uh, determines first place for Santa Cruz, and the winning uh, entries are then submitted to Cesar Devante and entered as part of the overall 3,500 um, submissions. Since we could not hold an in-person meeting this year, we're going to be showing pictures of the winners holding their certificates, um, recognizing their achievements, and the second and third place winners also received downtown dollars as part of their prize. And this year, I would like to recognize or invite our Mayor Donna Myers to join me in presenting the awards. Thank you, Doug. It gives me great pleasure today to acknowledge these creative and talented writers and winners of the San Francisco Sister Cities Committee on and Writing Contest. Each of the council members had the privilege of reading your work. We are so proud of your efforts and wish you all the best luck in the Stray competition. And our local winners are, I'll turn it back over to Doug. For the uh, younger um, category, ages six through 10, we have two second place winners, Emunu Pazner Minami with The City in the Cloud, Jasmine Harris Schenken with The Isle of the Wind, and first place winner, Sullivan Leiby with Clay and the Animals. In the middle school and high school, 16, 11 to 16 age group, the um, readers picked one winner, first place, Kyra Garner with To Be a Lady. The adult division, ages 17 and up, the winners are Marshall Pyrus with A Combustible Tail. Third place, Micah Posner with Puppet Tom. Second place, Joan Pribilish with The Scaland Iceman. Second place, Sylvia Patience, Fishtail, A Fable, and first place winner, Nancy Lentz with Never Wash and the Devil. Thank you all. Council members and members of the audience, please join me in a round of applause for these talented writers. It's too bad. This is one of those events where you really wish you could be in the chamber. So please know that we really appreciate everything you've done. And thanks to all of the participants and our sister, sister cities committee. We, have luck, we are lucky to have such an active committee and such a talented group of young writers in our community. So thanks for joining us today and for all your work. And great to see you, Isabel. Um, and again, another wonderful tradition uh, done here at City Council in June. So um, thank you all and um, appreciate us. Take care. Thanks for being here. Okay, we'll move on to our next presentation, which is a mayoral proclamation declaring June 15th, 2021 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. I'm going to be um, presenting the um, proclamation to Whitney Barnes from the Adult Protective Super Services Supervisor at the Santa Cruz. So I will read a few lines from the proclamation. And then I believe Whitney is here. <laughs> the mayor's proclamation, whereas over 1,600 reports of abuse against our elderly are received every year by Santa Cruz County Adult Protective Services, and whereas over 8,000 of the city of Santa Cruz residents are 60 years of age or older, and the population over age 60 is anticipated to more than double by 2060, and whereas it is estimated that one out of 10 Americans age 60 and over have experienced elder abuse and as few as one out of 24 elder abuse cases are actually reported. And whereas our elderly population has greatly influenced today's world, yet are often vulnerable to abuse and neglect and may be unable to prevent, seek protection from, or report criminal elder abuse. And whereas today there is a system a collaboration among the Human Services Department, Adult and Long-Term Care Division, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, 
the Santa Cruz Police Department, the District Attorney, the Seniors Council, Area, aging, area Agency on Aging, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, the Public Guardian Program, and many community service partners to prevent abuse, protect victims, and protect prosecute offenders who abuse our elderly. And whereas Santa Cruz County is a leader in California in assisting our vulnerable elderly citizens through education, advocacy, and collaboration on abuse issues. And whereas we, as one community, come together each year to dedicate ourselves to providing a safety net to keep our elderly citizens safe from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim June 15, 2021 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and the month of June 2021 as Elder Abuse Awareness Month in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in this observance. Whitney, I believe you are here. Um, welcome, Whitney, and uh, we're happy to hear um, any, any words that you have to say today. And thank you for bringing this to our attention. Well, I appreciate the time, and on behalf of the Adult Protective Services team with Santa Cruz County, I would like to thank the City of Santa Cruz for this proclamation. Our team responds to allegations of abuse, neglect, self-neglect, and exploitation among older and dependent adults throughout the whole county. We partner with the older adults that we serve to offer them support, guidance, advocacy, and navigating complex systems. We endeavor to reduce the risk and enhance the safety for all of the community-dwelling older and dependent adults in Santa Cruz County and ensure that our older residents can safely age in place, living in their own homes or in their preferred location. And the issue of elder abuse is significant, not just in terms of impact, but also in scale. What you mentioned, um, the issue is certainly growing with our ever-increasing aging population. Uh, National Council on Aging has published reports suggesting that roughly 10% of all Americans over the age of 60 have experienced some form of elder abuse. In addition to this, several studies estimate that the issues of self-neglect adversely affect somewhere between 10 and 21 American older adults. Bear in mind that studies suggest only four out of every 100 incidences of abuse against elders is ever reported to authorities. That highlights the importance of events like this. Raising awareness about elder abuse and the programs that are designed to intervene against elder abuse will increase attention to the realities faced by many older adults this awareness can also ease fears around seeking help or support and hopefully continue to create a community where we all come together to work toward the elimination of elder abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. And thank you again for bringing this to the city and we're really pleased to do it. Next, um, I'll issue a mayoral proclamation declaring June 2021 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. The City of Santa Cruz cherishes the value and dignity of each person and appreciates the importance of equality and freedom. And whereas all are welcome in the City of Santa Cruz to live, work, and play, and every family in every shape deserves a place of home where they are safe, happy, and supported by friends and neighbors. And whereas the City of Santa Cruz denounces prejudice and unfair discrimination based on age, gender identity, gender expression, race, color, religion, marital status, national origin, sexual orientation, or physical attributes as an affront to our fundamental principles. And whereas Pride Month began in June of 1969 on the one year anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising in New York City after lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and plus individuals and allied friends rose up and fought against the constant police harassment and discriminatory laws that have since been declared unconstitutional. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz appreciates the cultural, civic, and economic contributions of the LGBTQ plus community, which strengthens our social welfare. And whereas it is imperative that young people in our community, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression feel valued, safe, empowered, and supported by their peers and community leaders. And whereas despite being marginalized, the LGBTQ plus people continue to celebrate authenticity, acceptance, and love. And on May 26, 2020, the Santa Cruz City Council passed to approve displaying the LGBTQ plus and transgender pride flags on the front of City Hall 
and in the city council chambers annually during the month of June. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the city of Santa Cruz and urge to recognize the contributions made by members of the LGBTQ plus community and to actively promote the principles of equality, liberty, and justice. Thank you, everyone. And I want to also recognize that um, the cities of Watsonville and Capitola and the city schools and Cabrera College have all raised the rainbow flag this year for the first time in history as well. So um, we're excited to see the growth. And I've talked to mayors, many mayors who are raising their flag for their first time this year. So um, I think our leadership has been helpful in helping people, helping other elected leaders bring this, uh, this uh, expression to their communities as well. So thank you, everybody. And uh, there's a lot of good pride, pride events this month. So please join in and uh, have some good times with folks this month. Um, and I want to call out the Diversity Center for all the planning um, for the month of June that they put together for Pride Month. OK, um, we will move on to, um, I have a few announcements, and then we're going to move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be open for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items city council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meetings are numbers 11 through 35 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of information today. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. Yeah, yeah. There are none. Okay. Uh, I'll make an uh, announcement about oral communication now. Oral communications is an opportunity for the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at 6 p.m. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in at 6 p.m. tonight. I'd like to, uh, next is our city attorney report on closed session. I'd like to call on our city attorney to provide a, uh, that report, please. Yes, uh, Mayor Myers, members of the City Council. There were a number of items discussed in closed session this morning, which convened uh, via Zoom at 9 a.m. The first was uh, public employment uh, regarding the city manager recruitment. Item two was a conference with labor negotiators uh, concerning SEIU temporary employees. The city received a report from its negotiator, uh, HR Director Lisa Murphy. There were several real property negotiations uh, discussed uh, at this morning's closed session. Item one was real property at 115 Coral Street. Um, item two, properties at 790 Mariner Park Way, 141 Eaton Street, and 425 and 555 Bromer Street. <coughs> item three was uh, real property negotiations concerning the real property at 144 Fairview Place. Uh, item four, uh, it concerned uh, real properties along the railroad corridor and bridge uh, north adjacent to the Murray Street Bridge. Uh, owner of that property is Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Item five was real property at 136 Fairview Place. And item six was uh, real property at 132 Fairview Place. Uh, council received a report from and gave direction to its real property negotiators on those items. There was no reportable action. Uh, item four was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. The claim of Eric Price is also listed, I believe, as number 19 on your consent agenda for action in open session this afternoon. Uh, item five was a conference with legal counsel concerning anticipated litigation. Council received a report from the city attorney's office regarding one item of potential uh, exposure to litigation, and there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Kadati. 
I'll now turn uh, the next item on our agenda is city manager report. I'd like to call on Martine Bernal, our city manager, um, to provide updates on the city system 19 response in any event. Sorry about that, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council. I wanted to provide a few updates uh, as we've been doing. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to have our Fire Chief, uh, Chief Hyduk, do an update on the latest COVID-19 from the County Hall. And then after that, we'll have Lee Butler uh, provide an update on the encampments. And then I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about beach cleanups, uh, but uh, I'll turn it over to Chief Hyduk first. Thank you. I am unmuted now. Um, Mayor, City Council. Um, so I'm going to start today with a map of the U.S. and what this is from the CDC, and this shows vaccination rates uh, by state. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, you know the, the more populated places, in uh, particular uh, California, we are leading the charge uh, for COVID vaccination, which is directly tied to where we are right now within our county. Next slide, please. And as you can see, the golden state is becoming golden again. Uh, the majority of the counties are yellow and orange. Uh, there's a few that are red. Um, and this was from a week ago. Uh, I wasn't able to update it in time for the meeting today. Um, but as you can see in our local area, our, our rates of COVID have gone down. And that is directly tied to our vaccination that are basically crippling the ability of COVID to spread from person to person. Um, it is anticipated that a number of these um, counties will change, um, and, and that's good. That means that we're heading in the right direction, at least with this phase of the pandemic. Next slide. And so here you can see this is from our county website, and this is our vaccination rate, and uh, we're doing really good. Uh, as you can see, uh, over 63% of the population in the county has received at least one shot. Uh, the one thing that's a little bit uh, troubling is you can see uh, starting back in uh, January, very small vaccination rate. And then as we get to May, um, you know, really big percentage of the population, but it's starting to level out. And part of that is because the age range uh, 11 and under, uh, that still isn't available. Um, but there is some vaccine hesit hesitancy within uh, the population. But the vaccine is widely available, and uh, this is what's going get to get us out of here. Um, Locally, our uh, case rate is 0 0.7, um, which is great compared to where we were, and our positive is 0 0.4. Um, and that puts us in the top 10% within uh, the state as far as where we are for uh, COVID as we get further and further into summer. Um, and just as a kind of a, a perspective, Back in January, 35% of um, all people coming into the hospitals, uh, whether they're getting tested, coming in for surgery, whether, you know, whatever it was, 35% were testing positive for COVID. Um, and 2% and were. So radical reduction in the number, and that's directly uh, uh, tied to the vaccination rate um, as we go forward. Next slide. So where we're headed for here is locally we're doing great and uh, we're going to get to beyond the blueprint and that's the june 15th and that's going to be a state governor um you know decision that will impact us and really what this is is for private citizens and how they go about doing their business what i take out of this is if you've been vaccinated there will be fewer restrictions in what you can do if you have not been vaccinated um, a lot of those things will still be in place and you can uh, see here they talk about mega events um, indoors, over 5,000 people, you have to show proof of vaccination or no, a negative COVID test to participate in that. Um, and on, uh, after the 15th, uh, employers are going to have additional restrictions for how vaccinated and unvaccinated people interact. Um, but the more people that get vaccinated, the less restrictions we have and the more we can open up is really the bottom line. So as those, um, those uh, trigger points are hit, we will uh, open up and uh, to do more of, of what we have not been able to do in this last year or so. So we're definitely headed in the right direction. Um, and again, I would urge all of you as um, council members and leaders within the community to um, urge people to participate in vaccination. Next slide. So here you can see um, all California 
Californians uh, who are over the age of 12 are eligible for vaccination. And again, multiple ways to, um, to access return.ca.gov or go to santacruzhealth.org uh, for local providers. They also, the county health has the ability to make house visits to vaccinate people who are unable to come to a clinic. So that is something that is in place and they've made a really concerted effort to go out and get those people vaccinated that are in that age group or have that disability or inability to come to a clinic to get vaccinated. One of the questions I is whether or not um, under 12 will be uh, eligible. And right now it sounds like late fall, possibly. Um, again, that's still kind of winding its way through the process for vetting, um, for vetting that. But again, the more vaccinations we get into arms, the sooner we can get back to normal. And last slide. And I'm gonna end on this one because uh, I've been using and it's uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, keep your distance, distance, stay home if you're sick, and more importantly, get vaccinated. Um, they've seen a radical decrease in the number of flu and cold cases this previous year, and that's not tied to vaccinations, that's tied to our behaviors as far as washing hands, social distancing, and wearing a mask. It prevents the transmission. And so they've seen, it's just bottomed out. They've seen levels that they've never seen before as far as those things that we take, um, you know, as a seasonal um, activity. So these things work and we are getting closer to uh, getting back to normal. And I'm optimistic that, um, you know, that we're gonna continue in that direction, especially here locally. We're doing really good in this county. And as you said earlier, our surrounding counties are very much the same. So uh, regionally, we're doing really good. Um, and uh, more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. Other questions for Chief Hydrick? I'm not seeing any hands. Chief, and appreciate the reports. It's super helpful and also very inspiring that we're going the right way. It's great. Thank you so much. Okay, next, um, Martin, do you, are, you have additional um, presentations with other staff, correct? Yes, uh, so I've got uh, Lee Butler, uh, who's going to do an update on the encampments. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, Mayor and Captain. Um, as the county officials noted when they presented to you all on May 18th, we have about 400 shelter beds that are scheduled to um, no longer be available at the end of September, and that's due in large part to the expected expiration of COVID funding at that time. Obviously, this is a really significant concern for the city for many reasons, um, and um, city staff and two by two members are talking with the county to better understand all of their um, upcoming efforts to address this significant drop in shelter bed capacity. And um, on that note, one of the things that the county has done is um, abode services and um, I wanted to let you all and the community know about a um, uh, landlord appreciation event that they have going on a week from today on um, Tuesday, June 15th. Um, the <clears throat> goal is to get landlords to people who will be losing their housing, people that are currently in some of those county beds and they're offering a range of landlord incentives like um, guaranteed on-time monthly payments and financial incentives for signing people up, um, points of contact, um, a 24-hour emergency service, and then tenant uh, emergency contact service, and then uh, tenant support services as well. Um, at that meeting, they'll have um, landlords and um, program participants um, and they're offering a range of gift cards for participants. So a uh, little plug there. Um, the contact at Abode Services is Shiri Gradick, and her email is sgradick, S-G-R-A-D-E-K, at abodeservices.org. So we're encouraging landlords to um, participate in that conversation uh, one week from today. Um, Moving to um, the Benchlands, our team, our citywide team, continues to support the efforts at the Benchlands, um, both for the camps on the north side and the south side of the bridge. And 
Um, one additional announcement is uh, that FIRE is still planning to enforce a uh, no camping um, requirement in Hogan Up and Sycamore Grove as of July 1st. And um, we, we didn't get as much rain as we had hoped for this year. And given those conditions and the potential for fire, um, the July 1st um, deadline is when um, fire has been communicating to individuals out there and we're aiming to get the word out as well. And I'm available for any questions that the council may have. Hey Lee, is there for Lee today on his reports? Um, okay, great. Thank you, Lee. Okay, thank you. Um, just one other item, and also just to note that uh, uh, at, the, at your next uh, council meeting, we're going to have uh, Chief High Duke do an update on our fire wildfire prevention uh, program as well as kind of an update on our status of uh, where we are with the wildfires. You'll get a more in-depth uh, update on that at your next meeting. Uh, and then with respect to, just really quickly, just wanted to just for the the uh, public uh, make a comment about the um, the beach uh, with respect to, we've been receiving some complaints about the, uh, the trash on the beach. Uh, and just want to let the public and the council know that uh, we're aware of the, the need to have additional uh, capacity out there to uh, maintain the, the beaches. And we're working really hard to, uh, to do that. Uh, the biggest challenge, quite frankly, has been uh, the ability to staff up sufficiently. The CSAC company who also staffs up and does quite a bit of cleaning, they're working really hard to just get staffed up. So we're, it's just a really uh, been challenging to hire folks right now. Uh, and that's really been the, why it's been hard to do that. So. We're, we're doing that uh, and working to, to find all the all we can to uh, provide additional support out there for, for cleaning and for servicing the uh, trash cans. Uh, in the meantime, as we work to staff up, we do ask the public to, to the extent that they can, to please you know, pack up your garbage. If you see a garbage plant, please, please pack it up and take it with you or look for containers that are maybe close by that may not be full rather than just leaving the, the trash uh, containers that are already full. So just make an extra, if they could just make an extra effort to, uh, you know, again, deal with the trash. We're working hard to increase service, uh, but it's gonna take a little bit of time before we ramp up uh, and, and get it to the place where it used to be, again, just because of the staffing shortages. Um, anyway, just wanna let you know about that. Uh, it's not being ignored and we're working on it. Um, and uh, as for the public assistance, uh, and with that, uh, that concludes uh, my reports and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, thank you. Do any council members, uh, uh, council member coming, please. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you all for those updates and those report outs. I, I brought it up last time at the last meeting, but I know that um, you know a lot of the eviction protections and the programs to help support renters who have been impacted by COVID-19 are supposed to be expiring, and I don't know if there's any update that we have on, you know, whether those timelines are, have been extended or if, because I think it was June 30th is when those evictions protections are supposed to expire. And so I'm just curious if that's still the case. And if so, you know, where can we direct um, resources? Because I've received some emails in the past few weeks, but I would imagine that really trying to get information out to the community sooner than later so that they can prepare is probably going to be beneficial for not only tenants, but many landlords who have been impacted as well. Okay. I see that the city attorney, Tony Condotti, wants to respond to that question. Yes, my uh, office um, has been monitoring that issue carefully and, um, and are preparing a report to the city council that can be shared publicly with uh, identification of those resources as well as a status update on where things stand with regard to pending litigation. And I see Stephanie Duck from my office is uh, also on the call. And mayor and city council members, that's correct. Um, my understanding is the eviction protections, most of them do expire June 30th. Um, the, the city does have the emergency ordinance um, governing that with the moratorium on commercial evictions. Uh, that is tied to the governor's executive order, which is set to expire on June 30th. Um, we have not seen anything about him extending that or a plan to extend that. Um, in the, he's done so, so roughly the month before it expires, so if he is going to extend it, 
I would expect to see it around now. <laughs> Um, we are keeping an eye out for updates or any new legislation. Uh, my understanding is more legislation was promised after SB 91, um, but we have not seen that yet. Um, SB 91 did come out um, extending AB um, 3088. I think it was only like two days before that was set to expire. So um, big cross that there's more legislation coming. We are keeping an eye out for that and can provide more update for the next city council meeting on resources if you'd like. Yeah, and we, um, Council Member Cummings, I definitely have that um, put on the agenda for June 22nd as needed. So they, it will be, we will have a discussion and provide uh, updates to the community then. Great, thank you. Right. Yeah. And uh, I may actually have one other item mm -hmm. that I wanted to cover really quickly. Apologize about that. This is regarding just some announcements around the uh, Juneteenth celebration. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, just happy to announce that this year's Juneteenth celebration will be held on June 19th from 1 to 4 in Lower Park. Um, this will be the 30th year the Santa Cruz Juneteenth celebration has been hosted in Lower Park at the London Nelson Community Center. Uh, Juneteenth, oh, just short for June 19th, is a celebration commemorating the ending of the enslavement of African Americans in the U.S. Uh, Juneteenth is a special day for anyone who believes in freedom and equality for all people. And the Juneteenth event committee and the Parks and Recreation Department invite the community to attend this year's 30th anniversary event for amazing food, uh, delicious, I'm sorry, for amazing music, delicious soul food, interactive booths, kids activities, and a basketball skills contest. This year, the event will include a series of activities leading up to the annual celebration, including a, a liberation paddle out on June 13th at Cowell Beach and a mission hike the morning of Juneteenth. Uh, this year's celebration includes both a live event and pre-recorded content that will be available to stream from home or watch in the park. The event will follow all state and local event guidance for outdoor events, including masks and social distancing requirements and following uh, cap capacity limitations. All are enjoy live music, poetry, dance, arts and crafts, and delicious food at the 30th uh, Santa Cruz Juneteenth Celebration at Lower Park on June 19th. The event lineup and details are available at SantaCruzJuneteenth.com. And on behalf of Juneteenth Event Committee and the Parks and Recreation Department uh, uh, and uh, everybody here on staff, we hope to see everyone out there. And uh, thank you very much. You, you caught my one question I had for you, Martine. So for catching that, <laughs> I was looking at my list. I'm like, I think we forgot one thing. Okay. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, or sorry, Council Member Brown, and then Vice Mayor Bruner, if you have questions or comments, go ahead. Uh, Vice uh, Council Member Brown, first, please. Thank you. Uh, two questions, one related to the eviction protection matter. And thank you for bringing it up, Council Member Cummings, and thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, for planning to agendize it. Uh, I, I am wondering, so, so my understanding is that there are some local jurisdictions intending to, and, and some of them local to us and, and regional, uh, who are intending to uh, ex eviction moratorium at that level, at that jurisdictional level. And I'm just wondering, um, Tony, is part of your looking into this, if you've seen that happening, if you, um, if there are models, I think it, it would behoove us to, to think about how we can be proactive here. I know that in thus far, the, the state has been stepping in and, and may <laughs> do that again. Uh, but in the event that that doesn't happen, I'm just wondering, you know, what what to do. I mean, resource we can give resources, you know, resource lists to folks, but that's not going to uh, keep them in their homes necessarily. Yeah, we certainly are looking at what other jurisdictions are doing. Um, with, you know, bearing in mind that um, we we also need to make sure that we have a solid legal foundation upon which to make recommendations for additional council actions. And thus far, um, the actions that the city council has taken uh, have largely been pursuant to uh, executive orders issued by the governor um, that have essentially amounted to a, a, a lifting of a state preemption that otherwise would restrict our ability to provide eviction protections beyond 
uh, those that are uh, authorized under the uh, state unlawful detainer law. Um, but as I said, we continue to monitor, and, and the legislature has also made some, uh, you know, some legislation that has given us more flexibility. So we continue to monitor that and, and uh, we'll also pay attention carefully to what other jurisdictions are doing. Thank you. Uh, second question is related to the issue of trash pickup. Thank you for um, providing some information, um, Martine, about the uh, the challenges we're having and what we're doing. Um, we've been receiving, as I'm sure you have, uh, many, many uh, messages about this problem. Um, it's a problem that kind of extends around the city. It is more intense, obviously, uh, near the beaches in kind of the tourist areas and also in the areas in and around encampments. Um, and we are, so we are at a, uh, a, we're in a challenging place because we, on the one hand, don't have the resources to, um, to, to be covering all this, but on the other hand, we end up paying more in some cases later when we aren't, aren't able to manage uh, in the kind of regular course of business. So I, um, I, I'm, and it's a, it's a huge concern. It's not just on the beaches. It's what, from what I understand, and I had conversations with folks in Seabright about this also on the west side, it's, you know, up on the cliffs as well when there isn't uh, and there aren't trash receptacles on the beach. Um, people may pack their trash up off the beach to, uh, you know, parking areas and whatnot. And and when there's no place to um, dispose of trash there, there it often sits. So I guess I'm wondering. In I want to better understand the um, the challenge. Is is this the hiring challenge? Is really now related not to uh, resource question for staffing? But to not being able to find people to take those jobs. I just want to, you know, if that's the case, then I want to try to, um, you know, get that message out there that we, um, you know, that we're hiring and that's a, a position that um, is open at the moment. Yeah, and uh, I'll ask uh, Tony Elliott to weigh in if I uh, to add additional information. But with respect to the, uh, the beach, it's of Main Beach, beach uh, there is a combination of the city and the seaside company, the seaside company, uh, really staffs up quite a bit, uh, with, particularly with respect to Main Beach, and uh, they are having a really hard time, uh, time uh, staffing up, not just for beach cleanup, but also just for their, their own uh, operation of their own rides and, and, and other uh, uh, business activities there. Uh, with respect to West Side and the East Side uh, and those beaches, uh, I'm not as familiar with, with that, and maybe Tony can add to that. But, and before we uh, respond, I just also want to note, too, and uh, uh, that also we are having many of the uh, community organizations step up, and I also want to acknowledge their efforts too with doing uh, uh, cleanups as well, and, and urge them again to continue that work and for others to join in. Uh, but that has been, you know, also a, a, a great assistance, uh, but it's just not sufficient. Uh, um, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tony C. D. F. and more to add with respect to the other areas of the city. Yeah, thanks, Martine. Um, yeah, Councilmember Brown, I think you raised a really good point. It's, this is a, a huge challenge for us. Um, and I think, you know, in summary, you know, the factors uh, affecting trash around the community, I mean, it's coming from a variety of sources. It's increased uh, tourism, it's uh, decreased um, our, our kind of low staff numbers at this point. Uh, the seaside is still low on staff, so they're uh, amping up and hope to uh, return to full staffing by August of the summer out at the beach. I think the presence of a number of vendors, the sidewalk vendors near Main Beach has had a big impact. So, uh, you know, filling uh, dumpsters with boxes like that, fill up that space so that our uh, tourism crowd doesn't have as much space um, uh, in those. But I think across the community, whether it's the west side or the east side, uh, we have, just on the west coast alone, we have 32 waste receptacles. Uh, but we see uh, household trash in those. We see, you know, all types of different trash there. So the, the issues are um, open spaces. Obviously, uh, most of our trash in the open spaces is a result of uh, encampment. So I began my week last week with Mayor Myers on Monday, cleaning up Main Beach. 
Uh, and then I spent my Friday last week with open space crew uh, cleaning up a large encampment, a vacated encampment up in Pogana. Um We, as far as parks and recreation, you know, we are at Main Beach in particular, we've added uh, dumpsters. Uh, there are dumpsters covering Main Beach. Uh, working with Public Works very closely, we have uh, significantly increased our staffing presence out at the beach to address trash. Uh, we're working with volunteer partners, for example, Downtown Streets team, the Rotary Club, Save Our Shores are all lending a hand down at the beach. But uh, we, we have a major problem, and it's just the volume of trash uh, that we are facing around the city and from you know coming from multiple uh, sources. Now, I'll share, we're actually doing some analysis within Parks and Recreation right now. We estimate that we spend 10% of our annual budget, roughly a million and a half dollars, uh, on trash collection. And that's labor hours, that's just picking up trash around the community. So roughly, uh, before we do our full analysis, that's our that's our initial estimate, and it's not enough. So I think this is a challenge. I, I unfortunately don't have a good answer for you, but just wanted to acknowledge that the, the sources are many um, the, and the issues are really spread across the community. So this is something that uh, within Parks and Rec and then with uh, our partners at uh, Public Works, state parks and elsewhere, we've got to get a handle on how do we address this problem in a more upstream way, because the way that we're dealing with it is completely downstream. And at that point, it's already affecting uh, riparian corridors, uh, our marine sanctuary, uh, and ultimately our quality of life if we just have trash. So we, we've got to address this big challenge. Thank you for for sharing that. It, it sounds uh, about like what I'm, I'm experiencing, and uh, you know, your experience with it is very intimate, and um, you know, uh, um, your oversight of it is, I'm sure, um, challenging, but also very much appreciated. I, I guess the follow up question I would have, I'm just trying to think about ways to get more bodies available to do this work um, in, in whatever configuration that might be, seaside, uh, city employees, volunteers. And so if there are places that people who are um, paying attention to this issue uh, can go to try to find out opportunities for being getting involved, volunteer opportunities. I know a lot of them are kind of DIY. I participate in those too. But if there's uh, you know, a, a place, if there's any coordination happening uh, where people can go, it, just let us know. I think it would be, I'd like to help um, solve the problem and uh, find others who are interested too. Yeah, just to respond and for the public, uh, if people want to get connected to a variety of channels, uh, but if they want to reach out to us, we can help point them in the right direction. Uh, so if the community wants to contact us at Parks and Rec at cityofsantacruz.com, um, Trey is going to um, yell at me because the inbox will fill up, but please reach out to us at Parks and Rec at cityofsantacruz.com. And there are opportunities through, like I said, Save Our Shores, uh, through a variety of volunteer uh, avenues, through city uh, and directly through Parks and Rec. So we welcome that interest and, and appreciate that interest as well. Thank you, Council Member and Tony. Um, I've got Vice Mayor Bruner and then um, Council Member Golder. You're, mute. You're muted, Vice Mayor. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, Tony, before you, you leave, um, can you all, you, I know all the, the Things you just mentioned with the volunteer groups and the added dumpsters and added pickup and crew there. You also had mentioned in a previous, whether it, I think it was either an email or conversation about signage for visitors. Um, and did that already happen or is that in the works? That's a good question. We have new signage up out at Main Beach. Um, new welcome signs, and those include rules, but also um, uh, pack your trash type of information. When Mayor Meyer out at the beach, we saw a number of other opportunities to include signage, so uh, on waste receptacles in particular. Um, again, what we see a lot is if a waste receptacle is full, uh, people are inclined to just leave their trash next to it, birds get into it, and it turns into a big mess. And so 
I think there are some different opportunities for signage, whether it's on drains or trash receptacles um, or other, you know, other public areas on how to dispose of trash. So I think all of that type of information could be helpful. Um, and then word of mouth too, I mean, just the engagement, um, talking with people on the beach. I know the mayor did that on Monday. Um, uh, I think that's a, a huge aspect of this and our success is just engaging with people uh, to, you know, to encourage them to help uh, join us in that responsibility uh, to keep our uh, beach clean. And um, have you already connected with Visit Santa Cruz? I know a lot of their outreach efforts are to visitors, and I wonder if some type of partner communication could happen through that channel. We can definitely do that. I know they have made that part of their campaign for the summer in terms of pack your trash, but um, we can definitely make a more concerted effort to work with them. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Tony, for all the efforts. I know I'm spreading the word as well. Um, I think we can all help with this. Um, I, after the city manager's report, I just wanted to make sure we go back to yeah. a statement, the statements of disqualifications. I'm sorry I was slow to raise my hand, but I do have that. So, uh, I'll go back. I, okay, yeah. thank you. And then one last comment. Um, thank you, Martine, for bringing up Juneteenth. I also wanted to bring up, um, in addition, Saturday, June 19th is also Sunday, June 20th. It is a continuation of Juneteenth celebration and a repainting of the Black Lives Matter mural uh, on Center Street in front of City Hall. And um, so that will be 809 Center Street downtown, 10 a.m. to 5 a.m and there will be speakers, poetry, uh, roundtable discussions, um, painting, and community members, and it's put on by the same artists that uh, organized the Black Lives Matters mural last year. So it will be refreshed and repainted. Um, so I just wanted to share that information as well. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Golder and then Councilmember Brown. I had a couple of comments. Um, Martine Brunell and I were talking briefly about this yesterday, and I noticed when I was up the coast this last weekend, some local artists put signs that were really artsy all up and down Highway 1 reminding visitors to pack their trash in artsy ways. And I don't know if there's any artists out there that want to help make some DIY signs, and maybe they could contact the Parks Department on where they could get put up, but they were really cool. Um, the second one is we do have the uh, junior lifeguards out there, so we have those army of little volunteers that can help us with that messaging this summer. And the third thing is there was an email I got um, from the Seaside Company earlier today where they're offering a $2,700 bonus to work uh, this summer. And this seems relevant to me because we were talking about without the college students here, the high school students kind of filled in the next level of jobs. I know both my kids got jobs they wouldn't have otherwise qualified for, they would have probably started at the boardwalk. So I think the boardwalk is really um, clamoring to get people, and I know they've done the trash collection there on the beach. So if anyone's looking for work, it says you can get $2,700 um, for any time between now and the summer. There's details on their website if you, you know, want to work for them as well. Thank you, Council Member. And I'll just, um, Council Member Brown, I'll get you in a sec. I was going to queue myself up um, real quick. Um, just invite any council members on the weekends. Um, I won't, won't be here this weekend, but I'm planning to go to the beach Saturday and Sunday mornings. Um, I talked to about 20 families last time. Everyone was very re responsive of kind of fun for to introduce yourself as you know a council member of the mayor and, and people um, want to engage. They love Santa Cruz and they understand that we're understaffed. And um, I think it's, you know, that personal contact really made a big difference, I think. And, you know, probably between all of us, Tony was covering part of the beach and I was covering the other part, but um, it's not a huge beach. And with, you know, five or six people out, we could probably hit a lot of people as they're arriving and remind them of what our goals are as a community for our beaches. So 
uh, super low key way to do it, but fun to meet people out there and talk about them and why they come to Santa Cruz. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, Council Member Brown. I, I'm actually set, thank you. You're good, okay, great. Okay, well, thank you, Martine. We will go back to item number, uh, let me just make sure I get the right number. Uh, excuse me, so many pieces of paper. Uh, I'd like to go back to statements of disqualification from council members, and I will have Vice Mayor Bruner make her statement. I am making a statement of disqualification for items 28 and 29 on the agenda. Um, the Downtown Association and Downtown Management Corporation um, due to my employment with the Downtown Association. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the council meeting calendar. And I will call on the city clerk to provide any updates calendar. The only updates I have are the additions of the special closed session that has been confirmed for the 25th and 26th of June. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. We will now um, start on our consent agenda. I think what I'll do is we've got a, we're running pretty good on time. I think if folks don't mind, maybe we'll just take a very quick 10 minute break to use the restroom and then we will reconvene at 1.35. And then we'll, we will be starting on our consent agenda for the public who's watching. Thanks everyone. We will go ahead and get started again. For the public, um, we are reconvening. We're now on the consent agenda. And these are items 11 through 27 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 11 through 27. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or on or pull any items? Please raise your hand and I'll write them down. This is for all items on our consent agenda, items number 11 through 27 on our agenda. I see um, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I just have a comment on 25. Okay, any other? Council members that need to pull um, an item or comment or have a question on an item on consent. I have um, yeah, I have a question on 20 well. Um, so that's already been asked to, to uh, have a comment on. Uh, last call for any other uh, items for on consent. Okay, so we will not have any items pulled off of consent today. Um, and uh, now I will take this out for public comment. Um, excuse me, let's go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and do the comment on item 25 and then I'll take it out to uh, public comment and then we'll uh, look for a motion. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. This, I just wanted to make a comment. This item is our 
Measure D expenditure plans for uh, our transportation network in within the city and beyond. And I so I just wanted to to comment here. Um, this item provides an overview of the the many projects that are funded through Measure D. And um, while m most of the oxygen in the in the room of debate around. RTC projects and, and transit projects are rail and uh, highway widening uh, debates, but there's so much other work happening. And I think it's really um, worth mentioning that, you know, many of these other projects that we may not um, hear about, they don't get a big splash, but they are happening slowly but quietly um, through the work of our, our public work staff. Uh, and so I just wanted to appreciate that and um, and say, and encourage people to look at the list. You can see here that, um, you know, this funding is helping us build out our uh, rail trail, uh, segment seven, all of the components of that. It's funding, uh, you know, school safety, bike safety, and um, also looking at, uh, you know, bike, that's really going to uh, support and expand our multimodal transit ne transportation network. So uh, I just thought it would be worth saying that here um, and appreciating all the work. I see Chris Schneider's here um, and others in public works uh, as well. So thanks, thanks so much. Thank you, and we'll pass that on to. Uh... Thanks for bringing that up, Council Member. You're you're exactly right. There's so much air in the uh, out of the room on these other items that there's just so much really great stuff that we're paying through, and that the tax uh, that the people you know all of our folks who are paying that tax every year just know your streets are getting rebuilt, you're getting bike lanes, your kids are hopefully safer getting to school. Um, I had one question on that item, um, Chris, if you do mind. Um, I wanted to get a little bit of information about the Bay Street project. We did get a letter regarding that, and it does mention in the um, the action that the Transportation Public Works Commission took that staff will develop a plan for the Bay Street corridor that will evaluate multimodal needs and a cost estimate that will ultimately be included. So I think, I believe the question from that contacted us was there was concern that the repairs on that path might not be done this year. So I just kind of wanted to get a little clarification from from you on that. Um, sure, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. The um, Bay Street path, um, actually the project has uh, been awarded for construction so that will be happening this summer. Um, and that was storm damage from uh, I believe it was 2017 um, that we have the funding to do now. Um, on uh, the Bay Street corridor, we're essentially talking between um, Escalona and High Street where we have the uh, two lane in both directions. So we're looking at the potential, you know, improving the bikeways, um, potentially adding sidewalks that are on the edge of the road rather um, than within the uh, channel that's there now. So we have some work to do to define what can fit, how's it gonna fit with the amount of traffic, the number of buses, obviously it's one of the biggest transit corridors in the city, um, and uh, you know how we can deal with bicycles and pedestrians as well. So we're gonna bring some ideas back to the commission and then start looking about how we can fund that out in the future. Some of which will be through probably through Measure D. Okay, great. Thank you for that for that clarification. Appreciate it. Okay, I will take this out to the public now to see if any of our attendees are interested in public comment on our consent agenda, and which is items one, or excuse me, agenda uh, items eleven through twenty-seven, which is our consent agenda today. I am not seeing any hands being raised right now, so um, I will go ahead and bring this back to council, and I would look for a motion on the consent agenda today. And uh, Council Member Watkins? Sure, I'm happy to move the consent agenda. And Council Member Brown? Yes, I won the race to raise my hand, I'll yeah. second that. I don't know how Zoom figures that out. It must be a very uh, complicated, uh, something that gets calculated there, great. 
Um, so we have a motion by Councilmember Hopkins, seconded by Councilmember Brown uh, for approval of the consent agenda, uh, items 11 through 27. And I would ask the clerk to please take a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay. Caught up here in my script. We will now move on to our consent public hearing. These are items 28 and 29 on your agenda, on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on items 28 and 29, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any of the items? This would be item uh, 28 and 29. 28 is the Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessment for fiscal year 2022. And item 29 is the Cooperative Retail Management Business Real Property District Assessments for fiscal year 2022. Are there any council members that wanna pull either of those two items? And I will just announce for the public, um, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner has um, conflict of interest with these, so she will not be voting on this item, these two items today. If there's no interest in pulling any of these, any of the two items, then I will go ahead and look for a motion by council. Or excuse me, I'll take this out to public comment now. And if there's anyone in the audience, in our attendees today that would like to speak to this item, please raise your hand now. I'm not seeing any raised hands, so I will go ahead and bring it back to council and I'll look for a motion on the um, consent public hearing items. Uh, council member Cummings? Yeah, I'm happy to public hearing items 28 and 29. Thank you. And council member Contari Johnson? I'll second. Great, thank you. We have a motion by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Collintari Johnson to approve the consent public hearing items number 28 and 29. I will ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Oh, excuse me, I've got a quick, oh, no. Council member Collintari Johnson, did you, you didn't have any further questions, did you? I was getting ready to. No. Okay, great. Uh, can we have a roll call uh, vote? Mm -hmm. Council member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner is disqualified and Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, I will now move on to our general business items for today. These are items, this is item uh, number 30, the fiscal year 2022 budget adop adoption. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. So I will go ahead and invite up um, for item number 30, the fiscal year 2022 budget adoption. I believe um, Kim Krause, our finance director is here and Lupita Alamos, our budget manager is also here today for presentation. Take it away. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor, members of the council, uh, we do not have a presentation today. Uh, I just have a couple of comments about the budget. Um, the agenda item before you today is the adoption of the fiscal year 2022 operating and capital improvement budgets. 
Uh, the council did hold budget hearings on May 25th and 26th. During these hearings, we were asked to bring back some information, but no changes were made uh, to the budget. So uh, what you saw on the 25th and 26th is the same as what's in your packet today, as we did not have any administrative changes either. I do want to note that late last week, we were notified that we should create a separate fund for the American Rescue Plan funding. So we'll, we will be doing that and bringing it back to you in the form of amendment. Uh, as I mentioned during the budget presentation, the uh, Department of Treasury is still creating rules around the use of the American Rescue Plan funds. I do believe for the fiscal year 2022 budget, um, as we are operating at a deficit, we can transfer those funds into the general fund. We create the separate fund um, to balance the general fund budget. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, um, Director. And um, I'll go ahead and open this up for um, uh, discussion and questions, or excuse me, questions and comments from, uh, excuse me, questions from council. Um, and I will look for council uh, hands to see if there are folks who have questions regarding the budget at this time. I have council member Cummings. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I know that as we've discussed, um, the budget um, that, you know, a lot of the, the programs that uh, sometimes council members weigh in on in terms of community programs, um, that that was supposed to be um, kind of status quo and rollover from the previous year. But one of the programs I didn't see was funding for um, uh, tenant sanctuary. And so I was look, I looked through the, the line items and I know the tenant sanctuary we've in the past given them $30,000 a year to operate and I didn't see them. And so I was just wondering if maybe that was overlooked or if I'm missing something or if we need to add that. And, and the other item I would also bring up is that we've been um, working with the UCSC, the, task, the, the city county task force um, has had an advocate that's been funded through the city and the county and that uh, position also wasn't included. And so I was wondering um, what we would, would need to do today in order to ensure that funding was available for that position. I can respond to the tenant sanctuary question, council member Cummings, that is funded at the fiscal year 21, $30,000 level that is carried over to be funded in fiscal year 22. So that is in the budget. Yes, that, that's correct. Uh, so the proposed budget included items that were included in last year's budget where there were amendments or changes. Those uh, were um, uh, not included uh, unless there was a request from uh, council members. Uh, with, so with respect to the UCSC advocate position, there is a request for an increase. Um, we did uh, uh, distribute information on that. Uh, I know that there's a council members that are on the work, work for, uh, the uh, committee task um, work group against the work group uh, who uh, participated on that, and there is a request to increase the funding this year for the the advocate. Um, so uh, we can answer any questions you may have on that. Lee Butler is also on the committee, so it can also be available for any questions. But that is a, a, a request that's been uh, made to increase that funding. So we would need direction from council to add that to the budget. Hey, and then. Um... I had another, I had two thoughts. One is, um, so I know that there's been a lot of discussion, um, and I've been in communication with some members of the public um, on the potential for certain feasibility studies to be done in the future. And I guess the question would be, you know, if we want to provide funding to help support those studies, would we have to allocate those funds now, or would there be a potential some point down the line um, to, to have funding available for those? For example, we've been in contact with the people for, for public banking, and there's an opportunity to regionally, um, you know, help fund a feasibility study with other cities to bring forward public banking. And um, and the idea there would be that each city would chip in a certain amount. And given that you know those conversations are ongoing, we're going to be moving forward with that. But within the next within this fiscal year, there's likely an opportunity for us to help um, fund that study that would come in. And I know as well, I've been uh, hearing from um, members of the public who are interested in uh, us moving forward with some kind of feasibility
really a study around um, mental health crisis and behavioral crisis response. And if we wanted to see how to, that would work in our community, they'd want to do a feasibility study. And so I guess the, the general question is, you know, if, if those are potentially coming forward within this fiscal year, how would we um, be able to fund those kinds of opportunities? Uh, I'd be happy to answer that question. Uh, yes, uh, 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 certainly aware of the, the, the two op uh, possibilities there. So I, I think the thing to do would be to, those can come back uh, to council um, and it's particularly uh, also uh, relevant to bring it back when we know what, what precisely the amount is. So I think once we uh, get additional information with respect to, for example, the public banking and, and we have a sense of what, what they allocate, uh, we'll bring that back. And I know there's a group working on that, so we are preparing a, an, an item to bring that back to you once we get the additional information and have a better sense of what the, that might be. With respect to the, uh, the mental health services uh, delivery options, I do know that we expect to provide an update on that at your next meeting as it relates to some of the follow-up items around uh, homelessness. Uh, uh, items that the council asked that we look into. So we'll have some additional information uh, with respect to that at your next meeting and certainly at that time too. And, and once we get additional information, we can always do a budget amendment to, to adjust accordingly. And I had um, two last questions. They'll be pretty quick. To, on our, tonight's agenda, we have the, um, the consideration of changing uh, Loudon Nelson to London Nelson. And I'm just curious if that were to move forward, um, you know, would there be the potential, would, would, if we need to have any funding to make changes to signage, et cetera, would that need to come back as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll have uh, Tony and or Rachel uh, answer that question. I know they, they, they have uh, some costs for that and, and consideration of that, but I'll, I'll let them answer that. Yeah, thank you, council member and Martine. Um, I'll send it over to Rachel here. Rachel has the best details, a few different options on how this could play out with the community center. Yes, thank you, council member Cummings. And um, we have been looking at this, the costing of that change. And we do have some budget savings this fiscal year that we've already earmarked if that were to move forward with city council. And we have that savings because we were planning for the community center to potentially open sooner. We were hoping in the spring, but as the guidance still remains very restricted for indoor operations and programs, we were able to kind of uh, capture that saving. And the center is open now, but we would we've earmarked that savings to go towards um, the costing of changing the name. So in fact, the cost would be covered in this fiscal year and wouldn't carry over to next fiscal year. Great, thanks. And then the last question I have, um, last year, I think it was last November, we were discussing um, the rental data collection and that was supposed to come back after or around the mid-year budget and we haven't, that item hasn't come back yet. And so I know that um, after speaking with the planning director that they're working on updating uh, permit tracking program and um, having, after our discussion, it became clear that if, if we're to move forward with that, then uh, it would be good to try to incorporate that into the permit tracking program. And so I'm just wondering, you know, depending on the cost of that, how we could, um, whether that's a discussion we could have today or, you know, if that's coming back in the near future, how we can uh, have discussions around, you know, what the cost would be and how to ensure that there's funding available should we move that direction. Okay. I'm going to go ahead, Leigh Sure, thank you, Councilman, for coming. Um, and um, thanks for talking with me yesterday about this. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, a couple of the council members um, were not on the council when we gave our last date back in um, early November, but you may have been um, listening in um, as members of the public. In any case, um, the estimate that we have from um, circa February of 2020 was about um, $77,000 as the initial startup cost and about um, $42,000 um, ongoing annual cost for uh, a program, a software program called uh, 3DI, which um, has the, the capabilities to um, do a lot of uh, 
uh, clean online uh, platform uh, for data collection for the public, as well as um, some uh, nice uh, and easy to use analytics. Um, as um, I mentioned to you yesterday, Councilmember Cummings, um, the, the big concern um, right now is that um, we are um, substantially revamping our um, rental housing um, uh, program as, as far as it uh, interfaces with our permit tracking system. We're doing an overhaul of that. And um, we're looking at all of our new processes in um, uh, across the board in the entire permit tracking system. So IT, that's a, a really big effort both for IT and for our team. So from a, a capacity standpoint, we're really focused on um, uh, making sure that we've got efficient processes in place that we can then integrate into the new system. Um, we would not have the capacity to, um, to take on that new system in this coming fiscal year, but we could um, consider how um, any future um, software system will integrate. So as we're designing the system, thinking through how that a, a future rental housing data collection system may integrate within that, if it's a separate system, or how we might be able to collect information how we might design the system up front, so collecting information through the system itself. You know, that may not um, have as many capabilities as the specific vendor. Um, and so, you know, we would have some limitations there. But in any case, we can certainly think about that. And if that's something that the um, council would like us to do, we can take that into consideration as we are um, developing that permit tracking system so that um, we're considering the end in mind as designing um, the, the backend um, programming for the system. I guess my last follow-up to that is, is that program, uh, are we gonna, is there an item that's gonna come to us to discuss that permit tracking system or is that something that, a discussion that we need to have today or? Um, so the permit tracking system itself has been budgeted by IT. Um, we are close to um, entering into a contract. Um, I don't know, can, can chime in if that's gonna happen this fiscal year or next and, and um, how that budgeting um, has been done. But, um, as far as the uh, consideration, if you wanted to just, you know, provide us with direction that, hey, we do want to integrate something and we want to take into consideration the integration of that system um, for the future, then you could let us know that now. And uh, Ken can speak much more eloquently than I can about what that means on the back end programming and um, with respect to the um, funding and the contract. Uh, sure. Uh, with, with regards to the contract, uh, Council Member Cummings, uh, we are still in final negotiations. We've been going back and forth with our attorneys over the last couple of months. We did preemptively do a business process optimization with uh, Track It uh, Central Square to get an understanding on what really does need to fi be fixed. And fundamentally, they did call out uh, the rental inspections module to be whole looked at. So we're a little uncomfortable at this point just with how the data looks and how it converts to the new program. So there's a lot of work to do there before we would want to take on uh, integrating with uh, 3i and then just in addition to that the, the resource capacity of IT is really limited to take take on more than you know one or two of these at a time um, typically we see uh, an application upgrade like this take anywhere from 12 to 18 months so that's kind of what we're anticipating hope we're hoping for sooner but uh, needing to build in a little bit of time there in case we uh, run across data conversion issues or just uh, business process issues or staffing issues in both departments. Thanks, that's all my questions for now. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Thank you, uh, yeah, I have a quick follow-up uh, on the rental data question um, I, because I was also a member of the subcommittee that uh, worked on this proposal and learned a lot in the process. Uh, I bring if so if if we were to include a direction to take into consideration how, thinking about how this might integrate 
in, you know, in the future, uh, when, at what, some point, how, well, does that mean a lot of extra work at your end now? Would it require us to make any budget decisions now, or could we just say we'd like to take a look at that and, um, you know, and, and what would need to happen, I guess, in order to do that work on the front end um, prior to making a decision about whether that it, whether that rental data um, software would be uh, contracted and utilized or not. Just kind of trying to figure out how they fit together. And uh, the technical part, I have no understanding of, so I just want to get a better understanding from you all what you think about how that would flow. Can you want me to take a shot at the non-technical and then you do the technical or? Sure, yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> okay, um, so from the non-technical side, um, I don't think that you need to make a, um, a budget uh, decision right now. I mean, if we're, in, if we're um, taking on that software, like realistically, it's not gonna be this coming fiscal year. As Ken said, you know, 12 months, best case, more likely 18 months for the rollout of this system and we're not quite in contract yet so that will be the following fiscal year so so you wouldn't need to make a budget decision at this point um, and then from the um, the perspective of integration i'll uh i'll see um if if ken has more to add on the technical side but i think like you know as the subcommittee we talked about a number of different um uh data fields that we could um, collect information on. And there is a, a public facing element to, to the, um, the, the new permit tracking system. And so thinking about how we may design the system such that those data fields could at some point be um, made publicly available, probably not in as, as clean a design as we saw with 3DI, but nevertheless a functional design, you could potentially um, uh, think through where that might live and what we might be doing. And then if, if we do have 3DI, how would, we, um, how would we design the system so that if it's going through that third party or separate software, where would it then um, talk to um, the um, permit tracking system so that they um, can integrate with one another? And um, that's my my non-technical response. Let's see if Ken has anything else from technical side. You know, one of the inherent issues we have with our current platform is there's not an elegant application interface to work with all these other secondary and third-party software systems. So identifying the data that we want to be integrating with 3DI is not necessarily a huge task. It's getting to this new platform so that we have that kind of uh, up-to-date API or application interface with 3DI. So uh, just to support what, what uh, Director Butler said, um, not a whole lot of effort at this point in the funding. Again, we are 12 to 18 months out and the actual funding for the upgrade that we're doing right now goes back a couple of years. We've just rolled over because we haven't been able to get lift off. So to answer your question, I do believe that once we get on a more current system, the, the, the data sharing with other applications is uh, a lot, lot simpler. Thank you. Uh, I have one, actually I have two other, no, I have one other question. No, two, sorry, <laughs> two questions. One, uh, with respect to the UCSD advocate position, uh, we did receive uh, a communication from you, Lee, which was very helpful, thank you for that, uh, about the kind of breaking down the cost. And um, I'm just wondering what um, would, the, would the action today then be to looking at this budget uh, move, if, if we decide to do that, move uh, a particular allocation based on this budget uh, to be included. And so does that just, that would be the, your recommendation on how to move forward with this, making sure this gets funded? If the council would like to um, fund that, um, if you give that direction, we have been, um, we have been paying for that work through the planning and community development, advanced planning, consultant budgeting. Um, and um, we've in large part been able, because we've picked up a lot of grants in the last few years. And so we haven't had to bring on um, 
consultants through um, our own funding. Um, so we can we can still do that if um, the council provides that direction. That's where the funding would be coming from. Um, so you wouldn't need to um, change anything in the budget other than providing the direction to um, fund that. Um, and we would do so through our AP advanced planning um, consultant funds. Great, thank you. Uh, last question is uh, about the, the Civic Center. I, I, we talked about this during the budget hearings and, and I, I think I have a pretty good understanding of uh, the challenges there and you know, the needs and the challenges and kind of the, the longer term view of uh, you know, really, uh, you know, rehabilitating and, and making the civic uh, more a, a greater asset to our community. Uh, but we did receive a significant number of messages, community, uh, various community members, some involved in uh, some of the activities that uh, are um, that happen at the civic, and just others from the general community. And so, I just wanted to. Uh, ask if if you could say a little something about that and just acknowledge that this is not something, or from my perspective, it, it's not something that we're intentionally ignoring. There is some thinking going into it. And so I, I just love to hear a little bit about that. I think that, um, you know, the community is obviously loves the civic as do we and want to know what's next. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Brown. I think that's well said. We would, um, uh, we would, <coughs> excuse me, one second, I've got something in my throat here. We would uh, echo that same sentiment, I think, generally. I mean, the, the Civic, uh, Friends of the Civic, uh, Cabrillo Festival, the Symphony, uh, Derby, uh, Follies, these are all very close partners of Parks and Recreation. So this is really difficult uh, to put forward these budget rec uh, recommendations. We don't want to cut our budget. Uh, but because of the structural deficits that we're facing, we feel like um, we need to put forth uh, recommended uh, reductions uh, for a number of reasons. A lot of our reductions last year were one time in nature. Um, and so um, we are proposing structural reductions this year. Some of those include the Civic Auditorium. Um, what we wanna do with the Civic though, and our commitment uh, to the community through the Civic Auditorium is to make sure to the greatest extent we can that it's a, a venue for the public to, to be able to, and you know, for cultural uh, events, for performing arts, for concerts and so forth. The model that we have right now um, is, uh, is not perfect. Um, uh, and it's something that we wanna invest time and energy into to, to build a real business plan, to improve our financial sustainability at the Civic Auditorium, but it's also a venue uh, that uh, was built uh, in the early 30s, and it's a, we need to sink, um, you know, multiple millions of dollars into in terms of capital investment. And so, we're committed through our partners to to, you know, even though we're uh, um, offering up these reductions uh, through this budget process, our goal is really to build back better. We want to find opportunities to build that business plan, find grant opportunities, work with our partners. Uh, and, and really reopen and re uh, over over the long term. And so what we put forth in terms of budget cuts, it gets very nuanced and I'm happy to have Rachel Kaufman speak to some of these details, but we have an opportunity right now as part of um, the situation that we're in with, with uh, vacant positions within Parks and Recreation and needing to shift things around internally. Uh, we have an opportunity now through these reductions to do a little bit of some reorganization internally um, so that we can win the right seats in terms of areas like our community center, uh, sports and beaches, in those areas where we can generate uh, revenue and help not just Parks and Recreation, but the city recover as we navigate through the pandemic. But also the reductions for the Civic in particular, there are opportunities for alternative service delivery. So specifically, uh, we spend a fair amount of money on seasonal staff or temp staff, uh, and that includes uh, purchasing um, uh, products, uh, food and drinks to you know sell at the concession stand. So there are, there are a lot of these type of nuances to our budget reductions where we may cut budget, um, 
related to our ability to buy uh, food for the concession stand to resell. But that's an opportunity for us to work with our event uh, promoters and organizers uh, on things like food trucks. So is there, is there a different way that we can do this while we work together on, um, on, on kind of a new business model? So I wanna, I'm talking a lot here, but I just wanna acknowledge that we, you know, this is not something that we take lightly. We do not want to continue making budget cuts. It's very, very difficult. Um, but we, in facing the structural deficit, uh, you know, need to be responsible in terms of um, our budget. Um, and so, again, we want to, uh, you know, have these relationships, continue to foster these relationships and create opportunity uh, for the community to use the venue. But I'll send it over to Rachel to speak a little bit about some of the details on, on the, uh, the budget reductions that we've put forth. Thanks, Tony. And yeah, you, you covered that well as far as just looking at um, other options or business models. And it was something that even prior to COVID, you know, Supervisor Jesse Bond and I were looking at. And in particular, how are there ways that we could, um, you know, model our concessions that are uh, more uh, financially sustainable? And um, there are, you know, other side rooms at the Civic, and we were um, exploring if there are other rental packages that we could offer so that it wasn't, you know, there's other options for people to rent out the side rooms or other parts of the Civic rather than just as a large event venue. And I do think that. Um, uh, Jesse Bond is the right person for the job here at this time. I and um, I'm sure in your letters you saw a lot of support for Jesse, and so I really look forward to working with her on how to build the Civic back better, as we always have been feeling President Biden phrase there. So, um, but yes, I'm. I'm if you have uh, questions just about the Civic, I'm happy to answer those, but just know that this was something we were already planning on looking at for the Civic. And unfortunately, you know, due to this structural deficit and COVID, it's, you know, um, we're making these reductions now um, just in the hope that um, we can have a structural are able to build back and that we're not having to make larger reductions down the road. So that is the um, why we're doing that now. I just add one one other thing, if I may, you know, and I think the, the department budget overall, we were very lean. And so as we were looking at budget reductions, um, you know, we were having to really decide, uh, you know, where do those come from? And, and wherever they come from, uh, there's, uh, I'll just say there's, there's no fluff uh, in our budget. And so wherever those come from, it's going to be uh, felt, uh, it's going to be, you know, an impact uh, to our services. Uh, and so that was really challenging. And so these reductions are, aren't, you know, a, a value judgment uh, on our part of what's important and what's not, but it's really geared toward, um, it's really geared toward trying to get this right in a way so that we can build back and that we've got opportunity to, to recover. Um, and so, yeah, as we were facing budget reductions, I mean, it's, it's a matter of do we keep uh, parks closed uh, or do we reduce hours at the community center or do we, uh, you know, um, reduce services at the Civic? So this is kind of where we are due to the lean nature of our budget. Um, but certainly welcome council direction and feedback on how we how we move forward from here. I just want to say thank you for for talking about that uh, for just a little bit. I I and I agree. I, I really appreciate you saying this is not a value. I know that, and you know we've been talking about this, so we've had that information about what the you know the kind of short term and and longer term thinking is. Uh, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to lay that out and uh, hopefully members of the public who are listening know that our intention is to uh, build back better. <laughs> this isn't a values judgment, it's a, this is triage at the moment and um, I just appreciate what you're doing to keep us, keep it going. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, next I have Council member, excuse me, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, and then Council member Kalantari Johnson, and then I'm gonna cue myself in there. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Tony and Rachel, if I could invite you back for my question. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Council Member Brown. I know we've all had um, many conversations from our constituents and I've asked many questions and combed through to understand where we are at with the needs and challenges um, and the greater long-term views. So with these proposed budget reductions specifically at the Civic, um, can you talk about what will happen in this next fiscal year at the Civic? Sure, Tony, you'd like to take that one? Yeah, Rachel, we'll go for it, thanks. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, with, you know, guidance changing, and of course we're anticipating the Beyond the Blueprint coming up, you know, it's, it is hard to know as far as just both um, with these budget reductions and with the California state, what we'll be able to offer. Um, so that is a challenge, certainly a challenge to plan um, not knowing the guidance. So um, we have heard from some of our returning organizations and events that are planning events, um, like the symphony I know is moving forward with planning. Um, Follies has already um, canceled for this year, but of course we're, you know, we're hoping they will return next year. And we are just starting to hear from um, kind of larger promoters who are reaching out with this real interest to hold events. So we do think we will get this ask back for events. Um, it's really hard, again, to know. Um, I will say we have seen kind of across the board in recreation, this is a very general statement, but as things open up, there is a real interest and demand that happens right off the bat. So this could happen with events as well, and some people are actually predicting that. So um, these uh, reductions would certainly uh, make it difficult if we do suddenly get this flood of interest in, the, in uh, operating. Um, events at the Civic, and the um, the cut in particular to the temporary, you know, it's a, we're reducing the temporary budget proposing by half, which is a, is a, a lot. So that would be a, a definite, um, would hamper our ability, you know, and we will have to be creative on how to offer events, but we, we're not sure how we'll be able to support um, events. We might have to see how we could pull other resources if we did get a big name that comes in and we want to make that happen. That is where we um, can bring in uh, revenue when we get a big name person that wants to come to the Civic. So that's something we definitely will need to look at. Um, and it'll be just really an event by event basis on kind of where our, you know, how far we can those temporary dollars throughout the year. The Civic will be a COVID testing site for um, the first two months of the fiscal year, July and August. So we know we'll have some savings, you know, in that temporary budget, as well as we have a current uh, vacant position, um, a part, one of the part-time, or uh, one of the facility attendant positions will remain vacant for the summer. So we'll have some savings there. Hopefully then be able to spread out, you know, over the nine months. But um, coming into next year, when we're looking at a 12-month cycle, um, if we had this same budget, it would, it would certainly be a challenge. So, you know, we're just hoping to use this year to do um, some evaluation and planning and uh, kind of business planning around the Civic so that we um, may be able to come to Council next year at budget time on some, you know, recommendations or a different business model. But, um, I hope that answers your question, Vice Mayor Bruner. Like I said, it's very it's difficult to say what we will and will not be able to do, and where the uh, yeah, the pro promoters are, will come back. And there are certain groups that we work with regularly that we haven't heard back from this year um, yet. So um, it's hard to tell. I guess that was my question, and you know, some of the regular annual. Um, event producers, promoters, um, events that happen there, if there um, has been conversations about moving forward in some way and figuring out alternatives to the temper that is proposed in reduction, which 
my understanding is concessions and ushers and um, anything else with temporary staff? Yes, it's, it's concessions. Um, it's some of the ticketing or just event prep, you know, that goes in preparing mm -hmm. for these events. Um, there's a lot of the temporary budget. But again, um, we're, we're kind of spreading that out over a, a 10 month period instead of a 12 month this next fiscal year due to the COVID testing site. Or actually, I should say it would be um, nine months because for the month of September, the plan is to really focus on the building itself. There's some maintenance to be done. And so our plan is to open really to events in October. Okay. And the other things that, you know, happen at the Civic, of course, you know, um, we have our basketball leagues that we run at the Civic. I mean, there are a number of just city um, meetings and events that um, we hold that we will just um, have to figure out different ways to operate those. If it's the city staff, they have to, you know, up and break down their events um, when they reserve the Civic. You know, we may have to have more of that type of model. So it, it'll be it'll be tough. Um, okay. Uh, thank you so much for answering those questions. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Vice Mayor Brenner asked um, my question, and I realized my other question is related to Item 31. But I did want to thank Councilmember Brown for bringing this bringing this up. Great. I have just a couple of questions too. And yeah, I, I, I wanted to thank Councilmember Brown also just for those questions. I think it helped us all understand sort of where the Civic is at. So I really appreciate um, staff um, responses and ability to kind of help our, under, help our community understand sort of what's happening with the Civic as much as possible. Um, my questions are for parks. Um, so go ahead and stay where you are. Um, I just two quick questions um, on the aquatics pool program. I see in your goals for the year, you want to complete the pool feasibility study, which goes back to work that was done in 2019, 2020 fiscal year. Um, but I also see that the budget actually goes down. I'm curious about that pool adjustment there. It looked like um, last year, well, the year in estimate is 159,100. The fiscal year proposed is 151,965. So I'm just comparing those two numbers, but I'm just trying to get a sense. I'm sorry, the adopted budget um, for this fiscal year uh, was 156, so it's gone down a little bit. I'm just wondering, is that a revenue reflection of revenues? I'm just trying to understand the, the pool budget a little bit better, Tony. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Lindsay Bass, our principal management analyst, is tuned in here, so I'll um, lean on Lindsay here for some feedback. Sure, thanks, and thank you for the question. Um, so there's a, just a slight um, decrease in the pool budget that we were able to make because we had increased the budget last year to be able to do um, a capital project in a partnership with Public Works. So um, that investment is being made to upgrade the boilers. Um, we're hoping that that will allow us to take advantage of um, additional upgrades that we've made at the pool and uh, run the facility more efficiently. Um, so that is a very marginal um, decrease that we were able to make. We actually kept that um, higher than it has been historically, just because we anticipate having to make um, potentially uh, more improved, smaller improvements, um, just to keep the facility operating um, as that pool feasibility study continues. And the resources for that are wrapped um, in our CIP, so those continue to be there for us. Great. And similarly, a jump in the surfing museum budget, um, pretty significant from uh, actual to the 2020. Just curious about that jump. Is that reflective of anticipated revenues? I know that that um, or needs or repairs on the building. Or I'm just looking at that. So it's up. At, it's the budget now is 49865. So I don't know if there was cost savings because of closures last year or kind of where that number maybe just came from. Just I've had a few folks asking about the surfing museum. 
I'm assuming it says museum, so I'm assuming that's the surf museum because you guys no longer do the natural history museum. So I don't know if Lindsay or Tony, if you guys have that one in your bailiwick. Uh, that's correct. It may have been um, just due to some reductions um, that were made in FY21 that are being restored right. um, yeah. through the, from the one-time cuts that were made this fiscal year. So. Um, outside of that, that budget is remaining um, consistent with where it has been in the past. Yep. Okay, so it's been, it's basically been restored with this fiscal year bid. Okay, that's great. That's right. um, and then I, I definitely have some follow up uh, when we get back into um, taking any action later. Thank you. Those are my two questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and take this out to the public now. Um, so we are. Uh, uh, Mayor? Mm -hmm. I just want to just bring up one item before we do that, just so the council is aware of this too. So we are also uh, uh, recommending another uh, addition uh, or amendment to the budget. And that is you'll recall to following up on the discussion around the temporary uh, position in the city manager's office. And so we, uh, after following up on that, we are recommending that uh, that be changed to a 0 0.65 uh, FTE. Um, so we had, again, we had a chance to fall uh, and, and look at the options there. And so we're recommending that that be added to the budget, so 0 0.65 FTE. So Martine, that is in the attachment, correct? Um, I thought it was a 0 0.25 FTE, is that going up by? Oh, it, it's no, it's the uh, it's not in your attachment. I don't believe it's uh, because we just were able to finalize the uh, uh, the uh, number. But it's uh, uh, well, Laura, you can you can add to it. But basically, it's going from uh, in, temporary in to the agenda report that you have. We gave you an estimate for a zero point five zero and a zero point seven five. Where we came down on it was a zero point six five. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. I will go ahead and take this out to the public now. Um, this will be for um, our item number 30, which is the fiscal year 2022 budget adoption. And if you are interested in commenting on the fiscal year 2022 budget adoption, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Okay, I've got uh, phone number ending in 0575. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Baer. I live in the city of Santa Cruz, work for the city of Santa Cruz, and I'm the president of SEIU 521. I'm asking you to pay our employees a fair living wage, facilities maintenance assistants, courier drivers, administrative assistants, custodians, service trainees are all underpaid by as much as 26% when compared to other agencies of the same size. That's bad, but you know what's worse is that your predecessors exempted the city from the living wage order. To continue to take advantage of that to fail our employees by paying them less than you would pay anyone else is unacceptable. Please direct human resources to enter talks with the union to correct the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 1810. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Garrett, Garrett you're muted. You press star six. Garrett, you're muted. There you go. You can start over. Yeah, I pressed a lot of star sixes. Anyway, this is Garrett Phillip. I question whether Tenant Sanctuary provided much value in a year where there was a moratorium on evictions, and the original staff of that organization were the most radical any lord lord activists in the city. And personally, I think funding civil legal advice to one group of people against another isn't your job. Also, 15 minutes on the internet can normally answer any tenant rights question. You are aware, I'm sure, the city does not operate as a free market. It is a monopoly when it comes to just about every service it provides. About the only constraint you have is not going bankrupt. With that, you have a great day. 
not to abuse the justified purpose of the sources of revenue versus what they are spent on. Said another way, the purpose of the city is not to collect revenue from every source imaginable, then spend that money any way you please as if the citizens were cash cows to milk at will. For instance, calling the water refuse wastewater funds, enterprise funds, as if those revenues are for profit or should be used for anything other than producing those services is morally wrong and seems like it is and has been for a long time be a source of abuse of a monopoly. Water refuse waste, water revenue morally should only pay for the cost of those services, and I don't buy the suggestion everything is related to those. Only you make those expenses related by diverting that money to other expenses if you decide money can be legally transferred that way, it seems. Also, the list of transfers of unrelated revenue sources into the General Capital Improvement Projects Fund, considering the priorities expressed for that, uh, seem to have little to do with those, and it's another puzzling example. There are many. Water goes to fund public art. Okay, I'm not an accountant, but the budget looks hinky to me, and that it deserves a better explanation of your principles. Thanks. Next up, we have phone number ending in 1798. You could press star six to unmute, and we're ready to have you speak. If you could press star six to unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. We can't hear you at this point. There you go, you're ready. Or no, you're not. Uh, 1798, you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, I'll move on to the next person who's in line to speak. This is about the, oh, okay, 1798. Uh, okay, 1798, you go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, this is Judy Grunstra. Um, as someone who has volunteered many hours uh, ushering at the Civic, I er encourage you to support the Civic Auditorium and not cut staff. Only a few years ago, the city was celebrating the Civic's 75th anniversary and inviting people to share their memories. Many, many people have great memories of events they've attended there. We've seen what happened when the library was 50-year-old library was neglected, so let's not throw the Civic under the bus. Uh, and I was happy to hear the uh, staff first renting meeting rooms at the Civic because, uh, as you know, uh, meeting rooms are much in demand and considerable square footage is being devoted to meeting space in the new library projects. So, um, yeah, rent out rooms at the Civic and maybe reduce some of that meeting space at the library. Thanks. Thank you. And the last person for this is Krista. Hello, council members. Thanks for taking my comment. This is Krista, AKA Skirt Vonnegut, formerly of the Santa Cruz Derby Girls. And I just want to put in my support for the Civic. Um, please don't cut funding to the Civic. Please fully fund um, the Civic and the wonderful staff there. Um, I got to know some of the staff members who during my time skating and they're just, it's just a, a wonderful facility. Um, we would have, you know, five to six or seven events at the Civic each year. And um, it's, it's a wonderful draw for the community to come down to the Civic and enjoy, you know, sports or arts. And then afterwards you go downtown and, you know, eat at a restaurant or go drink at a bar, shopping or something. So it's just, it's just really wonderful to have, you know, strong support at the at the Civic um, to give the community, you know, that that uh, art artistic and, and cultural um, center that makes our community so vibrant. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll bring it back to um, to council, and uh, I see Council Member Golder has your hand up. I just was wanting to ask. Tony, um, based on the comments of Skirt and Judy, just to clarify, we're not, we're, we're cutting some staffing. We're not going to defer any maintenance or cause the building to go into a state of um, disrepair with this funding at the time, right? Uh, cut in funding. No. Yeah. Continue to maintain the facilities. We'll still be able to use it as CDC guidelines begin to lift. 
Yeah, Council Member Goler, it's a good question. We will, so the reductions um, include a variety of sources. So uh, in part, and a big chunk of those include our seasonal staff or temporary staff, as we've talked about. So those are folks who would be helping with ticketing or operations or setup or concessions, for example. Um, none of those positions are filled right now. So just to be clear, uh, that would be budget that we would um, that we would reduce. Um, as far as maintenance of the facility, we have significant capital needs um, at the Civic Auditorium. Our capital improvement budgets, part of the proposal for City Council is related to the civic roof. So that's a, uh, approximately $400,000 item just to replace the roof that is leaking. And we have a lot of needs um, to invest in the facility, and that's really from more of a capital investment standpoint. Um, the, the Civic Auditorium Master Plan, I think, is in the ballpark of $24 million total to, to redo the, the Civic, and that would be the ultimate goal. But as part of our uh, reduction proposal, we would uh, propose shifting uh, some uh, staff positions, uh, including a facility attendant, uh, moving some of those around. So I would welcome Rachel if she wants to weigh in on any of this specifically. But what that would mean is that with a reduction in overall events, we, you know, our, our maintenance um, would be reduced overall, but our routine maintenance, um, we're not going to completely, you know, turn our back on the Civic or, or mothball it, but we would step back in terms of um, that day-to-day -day maintenance, but that's largely due uh, to not having so many events, so we wouldn't need that set up and prep and so forth. And the wear and tear would be less because there's less people moving through the building. But, that's right, that's right, but the capital needs still remain. I mean, it's an old building uh, and we need to, to, to invest in the really the structural uh, needs and things like the roof uh, over time. So that's the money that we've got to find. And I, I want to take an opportunity here, actually um, appreciate uh, Skirt's comments a moment ago. Um, uh, Derby Girls is actually one group that we have tried to reach but have not been able to. So um, if listening or anybody from Derby Girls we would love to chat with them. That's been one group that, uh, again, we've not been able to really coordinate with uh, prior to this meeting. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments from the council? Um, I have, uh, I don't see any of I have a couple of questions um, before we get into a motion, and I'd be happy to entertain a motion. Um, uh, one question I had was, I wanted to understand a little bit more. Um, Ralph had provided us the two tenant sanctuary rooms, which were great. I appreciated reading those. I just wanted to understand a little bit about the contract and how it works. Um, the one thing that I noticed in the reports, and I don't necessarily think this needs to be part of the motion by any means, um, but it would be great if maybe some of our own rental um, rent assistance type of programs might be um, uh, be provided in a workshop setting. So we do have various things um, that are through our housing division and working with the housing authority. Um, I see, I saw um, quite a bit of information about state legislation and some other workshops and obviously a lot of work with individuals, which is great, but um, at maybe tenant sanctuary, um, if anyone's here listening or folks who have con contact with us folks, if we can make sure that, you know, we also are informing people as much as possible about all the programs and the funding available for example, first, last and security. Um, there are certainly a lot of the state programs that are coming out that the governor passed this year um, with regards to um, uh, forgiving certain amounts of rent that during COVID, so I do see um, I do see some a little bit of that outreach, and I don't know I haven't gone to any of the sessions, but I'd like to make sure that local programs are highly uh, promoted um, with this funding because um, I understand the intent is to help uh, tenants, but I think um, making sure that they understand all the systems in place that could be for their use is really important and could be a really important activity of tenant sanctuary. So um, I'd like to, I think Ralph manages this, um, maybe manages this contract. So I don't know if there's a way to give um, those folks some feedback that way. Um, I see Laura came on, but um, I just wanna make sure there is 
probably a, a little bit of a, not once in a lifetime, but there is quite a bit of resource this coming year, I think from both the state and I just wanna make sure we, we can somehow capture that in the scope of work with them for the coming year. Laura, do you have a comment on that? Um, Ralph is not here today, but we can definitely incorporate what you're requesting into the amendment for the upcoming fiscal year that we do with them. Okay, great. And um, one other thing on one of their reports, Laura, maybe um, it looks like they did some um, survey work this past year, which is, I think, again, helpful in understanding more about the population. I do notice they have income, um, they have age, and um, the amount paid per month, um, and some other demographic information. And I was wondering also, they have household income, um, I was wondering if there's also a way, maybe a way to capture, um, I see we have a lot of younger people. I'm assuming that those folks are students, but it would be nice to maybe also capture either um, uh, employment or kind of status in terms of that, because I see a correlation with people and also, uh, you know, the most people who are making under 15,000. So I think it's important to understand some of those things as well. So maybe they could add something like that to their survey. Um, but it does appear that this group is collecting data. It's not in a database as we were discussing earlier, but I think um, to the extent that we're spending $30,000 a year, I'd like to, if we can somehow pull some information so that we're a little more active in understanding what this group is doing and the kinds of information that can help, um, help uh, renters in our community. So th those are my comments on that. And then I do have- Mayor, a yep. Mayor, could I, could I, clarify for that. So in the last year's extension, we removed the requirement for the full-on reporting that we had in the original year of the contract. Yes. Yep, would, would you, is it okay to leave that as status quo or do you wish, or is council wishing to have the reporting back? So the reporting that I saw in the earlier report, which is the December 2019 report, that there was a long table that had a lot of you know various mm -hmm. um, information in it. The one from 2019 to May 17, 2020, it seemed like they sort of were able to collapse it so that we just have some good data points to work from. Um, I just would like to maybe have the staff work with them to make sure we're capturing the right data points as well. Um, and so I think if there's a way to also potentially look at uh, employment or status. So in other words, um, if people are retired, maybe they're students, maybe they are a working professional, you know, we, I, don't, I don't need to know if someone's a professor, uh, you know, a truck driver. I just am looking at some, some employment stats so we can kind of correlate that to the wage information that they're reporting in the, but I like the I like the second report. I thought it provided good information. Um, the table is pretty long and extensive, but so I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm, I'm mostly reflecting on maybe some other categories to discuss with them uh, in how they're they're putting that data together. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so I would look for the start to a motion uh, on the budget. It looks like uh, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, and, and just for members of the public, I know that it's always difficult when we have budgets, especially during these years when we're, you know, coming out of um, years when we've had major deficits and we're trying to kind of make the community whole again. Um, that being said, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, potential for us to understand how our um, the rescue funds are going to be spent. I think we're on a good track in terms of the, the recommendations coming from staff. So I'm happy to move the staff's recommendations. Um, and I don't know if I need to read, if it'd be best if I read through those for clarity. Um, so the motion would be. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah. So adopt resolution number NS29835, adopting the 2022, 2022 budget including the capital investment program effective July 1st, 2021, and to approve related and applicable transfers in, out, between funds, and authorizing the finance director to make additional appropriations to provide for commitments carry, carried over from the prior fiscal year, including contract and purchase order 
encumbrances and project balances, so long as there's sufficient fund balance to finance these commitments. Part two is to adopt the fiscal year 2022 priority one capital investment program projects and implement as funding becomes available. Three, accept the water commission's recommendations regarding the water department's fiscal year 22 operating capital investment program. Um, and then a couple other items that, that um, I wanted to make sure we included, which were to direct staff to consider what is needed with the updates to the permit tracking system to integrate rental data collection into the permit tracking upgrades, including but not limited to the incorporation of 3DI technologies. And then the last part, continue to split the cost with the county for the UCA task force advocate position. And I just um, was able to see that the county had appropriated $62,000 for that, and so the recommendation would be for for the for the city county task force advocate that we allocate uh, sixty two thousand dollars for that position. And I'll mention too with the the with the uh, task force with the um, sorry not the task force the rental data collection. Uh, this isn't really to um, to appropriate any funds at this time. What it really is doing is as the the permit tracking program is being upgraded to really see if, if we're gonna move in that direction, what would need to happen in order to incorporate um, rental data collection into that. Because it sounds like there, it could be done internally. We may need to go with 3DI, but it sounds like there, there needs to be some um, you know, thought around how that would be incorporated into it. And so this is considering just the um, like what would be necessary. And so uh, the recommendation would also be to get an update from staff when they when they bring that back to us. Councilmember Brown, did you want to second that? I did. Yes, I, I'll second that. Uh, thank you. And I have a friendly amendment um, duration. I'd like to also add um, uh, maybe another item um, six, which would be to. Um, request that parks and city manager and police return with an operational plan that looks to restore our parks rangers um, for next fiscal year. So, um, and I'll explain a little bit, make sure I get the, the, the wording right, but I spoke with Martine for an all about this. So the intent with this is really to um, not say that we will be bringing back all of our um, rangers, but I just want to clear for the public, our rangers were moved from our parks department back to the police department several years ago. Um, and in, in watching sort of the impacts on some of our parks and the lack of having park ranger present, which is very different than police, rank, uh, police presence, um, I feel like we have lost um, some of that individual park management and problem solving. And so my intent with this is that um, we direct the staff, um, either working with management partners or, and you don't have to put all this in the motion, but that we use um, the process that we've done um, to really look at an operational plan to plan for having a park ranger force come back to our parks department. So um, I'm watching as you read this, Mayor Myers, uh, and I think you got that. That's great. Um, and maybe I would add to looks to restore park rangers back into the parks and recreation department. Bonnie, thank you. So if that might be uh, accepted. Great. And then I just have a question on um, your, on, about the rental, um, the data, the data system. So your intent is to understand how it fits actually these IT upgrades, but because I don't know that we approved creating a rental database. I can't remember where we ended with all that. So this is just to, to kind of make sure that that kind of, and then have staff bring back a report. Okay, that was just my question. Um, okay, great. Uh, so Can we'll I, was ahead. that accepted? Yes. Well, this is the maker of the motion. I accept. And then if the seconder yeah. wants to land. As the second, I absolutely accept and, and just want to thank you, Mayor Myers, for including that. It's a, a big priority for me as well, and I'm sure others. So um, let's get it in the mix for consideration. Thanks. Martine, did you want to comment on that? Yes, I just want to make sure that in 
incorporated into the motion is the adding the 0 0.5 yes. analyst at right. the mm -hmm. Right, that was the other one, but yeah. 0 0.65, right? Yeah, 0 0.65. Thank you for catching that. It's this right here, right? The mm -hmm. temp position? Okay. Yeah, correct. It would, it would now be a 0 0.65 FTE management analyst. Did that go in as, as six or seven? On, oh, there we go. Never mind. Sorry, you guys don't have to wait for me <laughs> if you want to. Okay. okay. So we have a motion. Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, from council members on the motion? Not seeing any. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to adopt the fiscal year budget with, um, I'm not gonna read all the language again, um, but the uh, motion was up on the screen. So with uh, that motion was by council member Cummings and a second by council member Brown. Um, and I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, the city will be open for uh, business. Um, thank you. I just want to thank um, Martine and, and, and Kim and all the department heads and all the departments for all the work they did for the budget. These last, actually these last two years um, it has been an extreme interruption in the city um, and I know all of you spent countless hours pouring through your budgets to try to get us to a status quo budget moving ahead, um, but also um, really helping the, the council understand the, the work that we need to do ahead in terms of really understanding the structural deficit that we're facing and also um, how to plan for capital projects and also for some of the things that came up today just now in terms of programs and projects that benefit our community. So. Um, I know um, being on the, the revenue committee and also the budget committee previously, um, I just want the public to know that our staff just works tirelessly to prepare these budgets. And so what kind of gets distilled down into a pretty short report, it, it's really, really months and months, about four months of work. So I just wanna thank all of our staff and Martine for your um, leading that on and, and also, um, Kim, Kim Krauss, our new uh, finance director, who this is her first budget with us. So um, congrats and thanks everyone for all your work. We'll now move on to um, general business item number 31, which is the resolution amending the city of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification and compensation plans. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, I will turn this over to Kathy Bonino, Principal Human Resources Analyst with our uh, Human Resources Department, excuse me. Good afternoon, Mayor. Actually, I'm going to take this one. This is oh, sorry, Lisa. I didn't see no. this one. <laughs> no worries. All right, this one I believe should be pretty simple. This is a procedural process. When you adopt the budget, then we subsequently come to you and adopt a resolution to amend the Santa Cruz personnel complement in the class and plan. And that's what this next item does. So all of the staffing changes that you just uh, approved as, as part of your budget, 
now we'll do it as a resolution. However, I would like somebody to also make the amendment to include the 0.65 uh, management analyst position that was added. And uh, that actually concludes my presentation. Thank you, Lisa. Is there any questions from council members on this item, which is item number 31? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Um, I will bring this out to uh, public comment then. Are there any members in the public that would like to comment on item number 31 in our agenda? This is under our general business agenda. If you are interested in on commenting on the amending the city of Santa Cruz personnel, personnel complement and classification and compensation plans, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I'm not seeing any hands raised in the public, so I will bring this back to council for uh, continued um, deliberation. And I see council member Golder followed by council member Watkins. I'm happy to move item 31, the resolution amending the classification and compensation plans for the uh, 2022 budget. Okay. And Council Member Watkins? I'll second that and just to make sure that it reflects the 0.65 both SPE um, management analyst adjustment as well. Great. Okay. We have a motion on the table. Um, Council Member Cummings, did you, or Council Member Contrary Johnson, um, did you have a question or comment? I just had a comment. I wanted to um, acknowledge and thank Parks and Rec staff um, on their thoughtful process and, and the difficult decisions they have to make um, and make note of um, the increase in personnel for youth sports and youth programs. Um, we've been hearing a lot from Santa Cruz City Schools in our city schools uh, committee and just from the community of the significant needs for um, youth programming um, given the impacts of COVID and a year long, more than year long distance learning. So I just want to acknowledge and thank, thank Parks and Rec um, their thoughtfulness and, and their shift in staffing to meet the needs of the youth in our community. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Cummings. I had a comment and I actually just sent some additional language over that can probably come as a separate motion um, to the main motion, but that I've been hearing from folks and that it is really reflective of um, kind of where the city I feel like is heading and other people in the community have been expressing is that, you know, we're really starting to move into taking on homelessness as a role of the city. And it's pretty apparent, you know, with the part-time position that we have with the vacant um, homeless manage, manager position and now creating a higher level executive position, be working on homelessness as well. And so I was um, thinking about this a little and I wasn't sure whether to put this into <clears throat> the budget discussion or this discussion, uh, but I just sent Bonnie some language. Um, and so that for part of it, it's gonna address homelessness. And then the other was after having some discussions and really seeing how we're addressing equity the consideration of, you know, um, other cities have um, chief equity officer positions. And I know as we're talking about, you know, increasing diversity in public safety divisions and with the health and all policies, um, the two um, motions that I'd had, and I don't know if Bonnie got my email, but uh, the first part of it would be, and this can either be a friendly amendment or we can do it as a separate motion, but would be to direct staff to create a process and timeline for discussing the structure, costs, roles, and responsibilities for a division on homelessness, behavioral and mental health response in conjunction with the Public Safety Committee, city staff, and community stakeholders, and return to council with updates and recommendations prior to the 2023 budget. And the other part would be to direct staff to work with the Public Safety Committee to discuss the creation of a chief equity officer position for public safety, including but not limited to roles, responsibilities, costs, and location for the position and return with the recommendation mm -hmm. prior to the 2023 budget discussion. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is really trying to, you know, allow for the public to have some opportunity to weigh in on, um, you know, where we're headed with homelessness. And especially since we're gonna be, you know, thinking about um, mental health crisis response, but really seeing how we can create, uh, you know, where would this be located, getting some input from, um, 
staff and from the community and then also as it relates to equity especially around public safety you know considering thinking about whether we want to have a chief equity officer who really i think would be uh, it would be a good position to have if we want to ensure that you know health and all policies continues to be moved forward and um and so those are the two uh, I, they can either be friendly amendments or uh separate motions and actually i think i'd rather have this as a separate motion because i do uh, still have some concerns around the um, uh, deputy city manager position. So I'll stop there. Can I just confirm really quick, Councilmember Cummings, because the way you had it was two separate additional motions, but you can you have them as one additional motion? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just to clarify uh, what we're talking about here, it, the, the second motion is will come to us after we complete our uh, discussion of uh, personnel complement changes. Uh, and I, I just wanna say, I think, it, and I'll talk about it more when we get to that, that um, motion, but I, I want to say I think this is a, a really um, interesting idea, uh, given where we're at and how much we have struggled with uh, how we, um, however reluctantly or um, you know proactively, depending on the situation, uh, make interventions in homelessness response. Uh, you know, I think I think that having uh, um, some kind of unifying uh, space to have those conversations and to plan for our future activities is, uh, would really benefit the city. I think we've had a lot of trouble over the years because we have had this very uneasy relationship with, you know, well, is it the city's responsibility? Is it the county's responsibility? And I'm so glad to see that we're finally in a place where we're poised to make a lot of progress. And I, uh, I think that the, the city's role, um, you, you know, is becoming more pro sense to try to find, uh, create a structure, a staffing structure that, that fits with the um, goals of the city uh, with respect to uh, homelessness, mental health response, all, you know, all of the issues that have really been bubbling up that we've been talking about uh, and struggling with. And, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me to go that route. Um, I will say that with respect to the the personnel changes, I I appreciate the different departments' uh, efforts to, uh, and particularly Parks and Rec. You're, I mean, because you are taking uh, obviously the biggest hit. Um, and, but I'm I'm not going to support that motion today because I'm still very concerned about um, what is um, while not it, while it won't be felt immediately is essentially um, acknowledging that we we want to have another um, executive managerial position in the city manager's office. I, um, I have real concerns with that, um, and it has nothing to do with the individual who is going to be, uh, you know, is, is already working in that position. I'm, I'm very glad that that's happening, um, but I'm just not comfortable with adding uh, you know, and I understand we're not adding a position, it was in there, but funding a position and so making that position active um, is going to change the, the, the situation, the overall uh, personnel. So, so I just don't really feel comfortable doing that at this time. Um, I think it, it ought to happen in conjunction with kind of our uh, uh, city manager who will be coming on and you know, any other kind of restructuring that's gonna be done. Uh, so I, I won't be supporting this motion uh, at this time. It doesn't mean that I, I don't support the overall goals of uh, you know, addressing staffing to be more um, uh, effective at responding to issues. I have a uh, procedural question for um, our um, Tony, I'm, I'm a little unclear whether or not these, these mo suggestion motions sit with this agenda item. It looks like we're talking about a new department as well as potentially a new position. Um, and I'm curious, or I'm just curious about where this fits 
with regard to the actual notice item. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I think that's a good point. I think it is appropriate as a discussion of the budget, um, the item you just con concluded, mm -hmm. um, but um, doesn't really fit with this particular item. Um, you know, one thing that could happen is there could be a motion to reconsider uh, the previous item after the council takes action on this item. Okay, so uh, to the maker of the motion, I, I'm just just trying to follow procedural. I, in looking at the noticing, I'm just trying to trying to understand how we properly uh, honor your interest in making a motion, but I'm, I'm not sure that it fits with this um, item here. Um, so uh, council, I, uh, council Member Watkins, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, I think, so I guess, um, I'm trying to think about how to structure my comments. So in regards to the act before us, um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable as, as the seconder of that. In regards to the proposed um, motion language without kind of going too far into a kind of a, a realm outside of this, of this item, I think that, you know, generally, I guess I would say is, um, I think these are ideas worth considering and I'd like to have broader context, particularly with the health and all policies work and the equity work that's already established within the city. We have Tiffany Wise West who will be providing a report to us in the coming months and it'd be great to have that foundationally inform any kind of um, specific directive around equity, although I appreciate the interest behind that, um, but definitely wanna use it as a foundational component of what health and all policies is on the book. So at this time, I think I'd like to wait until that report comes forward and kind of we hear more about where we're at um, internally with our work around that. Um, and then in regards to the homeless division, I think that's a, a, a much bigger conversation that I don't wanna to go too far into, but I think what's being proposed really um, opens up a larger conversation around funding, accessing funding, uh, county over overlap, et cetera. So I have some concerns about knowing how far we can discuss that, Tony, I guess, in terms of what to kind of bring up around um, where to go with that at this time. Yeah, so I guess what I was suggesting is that if the council wants to discuss proposed items for consideration as part of your next fiscal year's budget, the appropriate thing to do would be to, um, to reconsider the previous item on your agenda relating to adoption of the budget. Um, and then the council could proceed to take action on this particular item uh, concerning the uh, personnel uh, complement uh, and, and then return to that discussion uh, if there's a motion to reconsider that's adopted on item uh, uh, 30. I, um, if I can for clarification, Mayor. Yeah, please go ahead. In regards to the reconsideration of the previous item, I, um, I'm hesitant to move in that direction given that the recommendation isn't until next fiscal year for these to move forward. I think that these require robust conversations with more information and potential um, uh, considerations on, on, in both sections. So given that there's not a huge urgency to, uh, to um, accompany the previous item, I don't know if that's necessarily required. They can come back as, an, as a future agenda item. Is that correct, Tony? Uh, it, yeah, it could, that could be brought up at any time during the, the year as the, as the council moves to, uh, preparing to adopt its next, next fiscal year budget as well. Um, so that I don't think it's necessary for the council to take action on that. But if you do uh, are inclined to do that, my recommendation would be that you uh, consider uh, a motion to reconsider item 30 and then add that as the action approving the budget for this fiscal year. So I have, so these were friendly amendments to the motion on the floor from what I did. As I understood it, it was uh, at the, toward the end of uh, council member Cummings comments, he, he indicated that he preferred that it be uh, presented as a separate motion. So my recommendation would be to uh, have the council move forward on the motion that's on the floor. And then if the council wanna, wants to continue discussion of the next fiscal year uh, budget considerations, 
that you do so as I've, as I've suggested. So let me just ask um, Council Member Kontar Johnson and Vice Mayor Bruner, um, do you have questions on the motion on the floor or comments on the motion on the floor or the new items that may be revisited in a different, different motion going back to item 30? But I'm not guaranteeing that that's gonna happen either because we need a motion to actually do that. Um, Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Yeah, I had uh, comments on the, the second. Um, so if that's not appropriate at this time, then I'll hold my comment. Okay. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I was just gonna um, mention that um, similar to Council Member Brown, I've heard concerns from members of the community around um, the creation of the, or the filling of the deputy city manager position. I thought when this came up last year when we voted on this, uh, because this, this isn't the first time it's come before us, but I thought that um, staff at the planning director who's been taking on these responsibilities was being compensated for the additional work that he had been doing to address these issues. And so um, it, uh, there's been a lot of concern coming from the community around why are we getting rid of a planning director position and why are we creating this new position? So that's been something I've been trying to, to grapple with. Um, community who've reached out to me have, have expressed their discomfort with that. Um, and that's the only, I'd say, position that, you know, that's being listed that I've had concerns with um, and that I've been hearing from people who've been concerned about um, us taking action on that um, item for us today. So just wanted to express that, <clears throat> um, that I'm supportive of the other positions, but that's one of the positions that has, has, has um, there's been a lot of concern raised around it. And so um, that's gonna be my hesitation for um, moving forward with that item. And again, um, and then I'll, I'll withdraw the motion that I made earlier, but I would like to make a motion to reconsider item number 30, um, because I, I think that where we're headed, have, like this is the year when we can have all these discussions and we can learn about, you know, um, we can take the input that we're receiving from the health and policy report that's coming forward. That can help us and in, help inform whether we should move forward with the division. But if we can get some momentum and, and start determining what a process could be and how we can move forward with having those conversations, similar to what we just heard with bringing back the parks and rec with, um, park rangers, I think that it'd be good for us to, you know, um, have a discussion around considering uh, about forward. Okay. Uh... So, did you make a motion? I would, I would do my motion, but I said I'd be prepared okay. to make for reconsidering. Okay. Um, I might just call on either Lisa Murphy or, or Martine Bernal. My understanding with, just so for public clarification, is that the, re, um, the reassignment, or I don't know what the right term is, with um, the deputy city manager position and I'm assuming it falls under that deputy city manager two, which also allows basically for a person to fill an executive director level position of a department. And so is that kind of what we are doing with the, with our deputy city manager slash, you know, person who is now also assigned to homelessness? It, do you understand my question? When I read the staff report, that is basically what we're doing is that we are creating a deputy city manager um, uh, place in the city manager's office and but that position has two classifications, a one and a two and the two does allow for that person to actually serve also as a department head so we're not really losing our depart our our um, director of planning and community development is that is that correct is that's it that's right that's, that's correct so basically all we're doing is assigning uh, the level of pay that's commensurate to a department head that has a larger set of uh, responsibilities. So it's equivalent to a department head that has a, a bigger department. Uh, so uh, that is really the change. And the title is, is simply one that uh, is uh, one that oversees uh, and, and looks at the operations that, are, that cross across departmental lines. And so. Uh, which again is the title that we had before. So because the scope of the work involves working with all, you know, it's interdepartmental in nature and working with departments and uh, regional partners and, and all of that. So uh, the, basically the E would, uh, quarter percent of his time would be in the homelessness uh, response uh, area. 
And then the, the three quarter time would be you know, as planning director. And that is included in the staff report for the item that we are current. I want to make sure for hearing mostly from the public that that is the staff report description assigned or uh, associated with item number 31. Correct. It details off that information. Okay. Um, Council Member Golder and then Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. And again, we're just focusing on item number 31 and uh, the existing motion. Martin Bernal kind of answered my question there, so it's like I put my hand down. It was, it was yes, yeah, answer. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member uh, Colin Terry Johnson? Yeah, thank Thanks. you for that clarification. I did just want to reiterate that my understanding is that we're not adding an executive position, we're expanding the scope of. Um, this position, hence the, the shift in the title. Um, and just a note that we we are we have directed and asked us to do um, quite a breadth of services around homelessness. And I'm I'm so happy to, um, at least in recent history, I don't know that we've done but we've made this kind of effort. Um, and we certainly need the infrastructure to put that in place. Uh, a couple meetings ago, last meeting when I. Um, made the comment that maybe we should wait for the new city manager to come in because this is a significant restructure. Um, Laura responded with, you have directed us and asked us to do this work now, and, and you're absolutely right. We want to move with the safe sleeping sites. We move with um, the transitional shelters. There's a whole array of services that we are going to stand up. Um, and having worked with, uh, with the county during COVID, Standing up a, a shelter sheltering program is, is not um, an easy task. So I, I I agree that we need to um, restructure quickly and we need to restructure thoughtfully so that we can actually implement the direction that we've given to staff um, should the ordinance pass later. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Now, this is uh, mostly a response to Council Member Kalantari Johnson's point, which I absolutely agree with, uh, related to uh, staffing up or making sure that we have the staffing to get the work done. So I don't disagree with that, and my intention here is not to suggest that I don't want that work to happen. Um, and so I just the the this issue has become very convoluted i'm not going to call it complicated it actually is pretty simple um and so but because it's been framed for us in a way that um suggests that this is that that's very particular to this particular case when i step back and i look at job classifications and the, the classification complement within the city manager's office, which has expanded significantly over the past decade. Uh, to be fair, a lot of you know the work has expanded, but um, I, I just feel like um, you know we are we are kind of adding a position. So just so I just to try to make clear what I'm trying to say here, um, could somebody answer the question? Uh, what what would the city do? What will we do if, and at some point, the current occupant of that position uh, will either uh, uh, move up, move on, or retire? And so then, what will we do? Will we hire a planning director and another deputy city manager? Um, I'll ask Martina. In which case, we are adding another managerial executive position. Uh, well, first of all, we don't. We're not anticipating that. <laughs> That's not something that we anticipate. Uh, so, however, what we would do um, at that time, uh, and actually, it would, it would likely be my successor, uh, would then evaluate uh, the structure and, and whether uh, it would continue in that fashion or not. Uh, so, uh, and then make recommendations accordingly. Uh, uh, and so, if, if the structure works well, and we can recruit another. Uh, individual that could they can maintain that that uh, complement of responsibilities and and if it was working well then that would be appropriate if uh, there was another model that made more sense given what's learned and the experience that's uh, uh, that you know that that is learned then there might be a, a different recommendation. Okay, <clears throat> I've got but, but to clarify, 
that the planning and community development director with the action that you take today is no longer funded. So if the hypothetical happened, whoever is the city manager at that point would only be able to fill the deputy city manager. If he or she wanted to organize it differently, they could not hire the planning and community development director job because there's no budget appropriation for it by your action today. Okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor to basically go with the staff um, recommendation. Um, is there additional, I see council member Kalantari Johnson and then council member Golder, and then I'd like to maybe vote on this motion. Um, Sorry, I just forgot to put my hand down. Oh, no worries, no worries at all then, okay. I would like to add one comment in that we, we, I, we, I feel like we're kind of at a point in Santa Cruz where we're moving into kind of unchartered territory where we haven't in the past as a city, to the best of my knowledge, collaborated in, in such a way with the county and with the state and really worked towards um, finding solutions for homelessness as a city. And so I'm thinking, in, in my thinking, honestly, I would like it to be a fully funded 1.0 FTE position with a little department. I I don't think that that's feasible right now, but I think moving into this realm where we're trying to create storage facilities, we're trying to create sleeping sites, where we're trying to increase shelter beds, where we're working on bad advocacy at the state and federal level for resources. Um, it's a lot of work and it's, it is almost like a whole other department that's never been created within our city before. And so I think to the extent that we can um, have cost savings almost, having one person do that job where we're saving money on benefits and retirement at this point, I think it's gonna be beneficial for everybody at, um, moving forward and ultimately down the road, it would be great we could afford to make it two different and increase that capacity. But I think the um, honoring the work of the department has stepped up and has been serving in this capacity already and acknowledging that with this title and um, it, it's, it's really important work. My comment. Thank you, council member. Vice Bruner, vice comment. Yes, thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, Council Member Golder, you brought up um, a point that, um, you know, we're really taking on some new responsibilities as a city. And, uh, you know, what I'm understanding is that we're forming this team. It's not quite a department since there is no department that, uh, technically works with impacts of homelessness in the past historically that has been through other organizations and the county. And so we're really proactively, it sounds like staff is making um, changes and with our uh, recommendations of late and direction of late to a whole array of services, we're forming this team. Um, I wonder if it's appropriate if Laura has slide number six, um, I mean, that just is so um, helpful to understand the scope of, of, of work that um, this position, I think, to see uh, everything that is um, needed and why it is in the city manager's department is because it's dealing with each department, with with fire, with police, with water, with public works. And so that comes from the city manager's office. And um, so those levels of, um, of all that work, is Laura here? She is here. <laughs> I'm calling on you. Do you, um, yep, I don't even don't know worry. what to call it, um, but yeah. Um, if, so 
the homelessness response is a program within the city manager's office. It is not an, a department nor a division. It is mm -hmm. just one of the programs. It's an integrated citywide program that the city man that sits in the city manager's office because it is citywide and has um, substantial needs to be able to integrate across multiple well as integrate with regional partners. So similar to how climate action and sustainability ended up being seated in the city manager's office and health and all policies as well, homelessness response is another yes, the program that ended up seated here. So this is just an overview of the work that happens in the homelessness response space. In, in the meeting space, we participate in two by two with the county and that involves our elected officials with the county's elected officials. Um, are you guys able to hear me very well? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you more. And then the Homeless Action Partnership, we participate in the West Coast Cities and United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. We have uh, every other week city county coordination meetings. We have a citywide operational coordination meeting across all departments that we coordinate. An internal city manager's office homelessness response team meeting that we do. And then we also um, coordinate and do uh, homelessness response out into the community from the city manager's office. And then um, we also participate in uh, the emergency operations center work as it comes up. As you know, we have, we're participating right now because of as well as the CZU Lightning Fire, and then any ad hoc meetings that come up. Additionally, um, the actual work that is not meetings, this is a smattering of what we do in this function. So there's outreach, there's pop-up encampment manager, there's vendor and contract manager management, any temporary personnel that needs to be managed in this uh, gets managed out of the city manager's office resources. We coordinate with AFC for the safe parking program. Uh, we work with the Salvation Army and the county for the armory. We help with the San Lorenzo Park and bench lands, community requests for service that come in, as calls that come in from the community or emails are on the IT portal. We'll help respond to those if they relate to homelessness. Uh, the hygiene bay remodel, where we are leading that project and uh, along with public works and housing matters and county. Uh, other CDBG related projects that are funded out of our um, community development block grant programming in the homelessness space, we'll have to coordinate and pr project manage those. Communications and engagement happens from our centralized communications manager, but the subject matter expertise for those communications and those community meetings comes from the staff. Uh, we also coordinate community partnerships with Housing Matters, Encompass, Downtown Streets, and the county. And then all of the work associated with the Camping Services and Standards Ordinance, uh, the request for qualification has been coordinated from this team. And then the stand up of the storage, they the managed encampment, the operational policies that you've asked for, restorative justice, and exploring those options, as well as how we report back to you. Those would all be uh, developed from this group. We also do location assessments and work with uh, economic development for real estate identification. Whenever there's a civil grand jury and it has to have follow-up from homelessness, it comes out of this team. Uh, we explore uh, other service models as you've been directed. That's one of the things that's on the plate right now. And then any ordinances and other policies. And then the short term, medium term, and long term strategy and planning that needs to happen will come from this um, small but mighty work group. So as you can see from this plethora of items that I've just gone over really quickly, it is well more than 1.75 FTEs that we're asking them. Thank you, Laura. I and I think hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. And if it's the pleasure thank of the council, you. oh, thank you, Vice Mayor. If it's the pleasure of council. I'll go ahead and uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, go ahead and give that approach. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a motion by Council Member by Boulder council. and moved by seconded by Council Member Watkins to go with the staff re recommendation which is adopting a resolution amending the City of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification and compensation plans for the following departments. 
economic development, police, finance, parks and recreation, planning and community development departments, and city manager's office. So I would like to ask for a roll call vote on this. Um, thank you, Mayor. So just to confirm the city manager, there's the 0.65 language, right? Yes. Okay. It would be the existing requests in the agenda report as they stand with the addition of the 0.65 appropriation for the management analyst that the council approved in item 30. Okay. Great. And I do see Mr. Watkins. No, I'm sorry. Um, Calentari Johnson. Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? No, and for the record, the, my no vote is largely around the filling of the deputy city manager position. I'm, I'm in favor of all the other changes. Boulder? Aye. Turner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes with five in favor of the motion and two against. Okay, uh, we will move on to item number 32. Okay. Council member Cummings. Before we move on, I'd like to actually make a motion to reconsider item 30 of the budget um, so that we can discuss the processes for the two items that I mentioned previously around uh, discussions for the homeless uh, response division and um, uh, I lost my notes, but there was the chief uh, ex uh, equity officer. Is there a second for that? Second. Second. Motion on the floor to reconsider adoption of <coughs> item, um, item number 30, which is adopting the budget um, to include um, a assess, almost creating a homeless um, a response division and a chief equity officer. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. I'm sorry, um, Vice Mayor Bruner. Can I ask a clarifying question? My sure. understanding was that Tony Condotti mentioned um, two options. One would be to reconsider item 30 and then have that discussion. The other would be to um, make, was it a motion to bring it forward for another, for further discussion at a future meeting? Was that my understanding? I don't, I don't recall saying that specifically, but those are indeed the council's consideration. I see council member Watkins. I am, um, I appreciate the, I, I just sort of want to reiterate my comments before. I appreciate the interest in wanting to move forward in some of these discussions. I again feel that the equity position or conversation really would be um, informed and uh, uh, informed by the health and health policies work we've been doing. So I would like to have that, you know, we could potentially discuss that, discuss that at this time. and. In regards to the homeless division, I, I feel like that's also a more robust conversation that I don't necessarily feel like needs to be tied to a, uh, a conversation for next year's budget adoption and, and sort of reverting back to the next item reasons I don't, I, I won't be supporting the motion. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just make a quick um, comment too on the motion. I won't, I won't be supporting it. Um, I, I feel like we um, we have made great strides and we are going to start doing things that we have not done before with regards to um, hopefully uh, managing and assisting people in homelessness. Um, but we also are faced with a structural deficit that's gonna move forward and adding um, additional, um, you know, directing staff right now to go into um, 
uh, you know, evaluating additional new un completely unfunded positions and then also divisions, new divisions within city, um, like quite a quite a leap to me. So I, I, I won't be supporting the motion. Um, so we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins? No. Kalantari Johnson? No. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. And I'd, I'd like to say for the record that the purpose for doing this is to have discussions and to initiate a process so that we can get input from the community on creating these programs. Many of my colleagues had just mentioned that, you know, we may need to start having these discussions because we're moving into new uncharted territories. And um, especially if we're going to be, you know, really focusing on equity as it relates to public safety, this is an opportunity to initiate those conversations. And so, um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that that, that was clear. Um, so uh, I'm voting in favor. Bye. Okay. No. Vice Mayor Brunner. Um, I uh, would like to say that I agree in having those discussions. However, tying it to um, item 30 and reverting back to item 30 doesn't, um, I'm voting no on that. And I'd like to um, really bring forward that we have those discussions for a future date. And I um, appreciate that tie-in with the um, health and all policies reference that Council Member Watkins mentioned. I think uh, an appropriate place to consider. Mayor Myers? I'm sorry. I'm gonna vote no. So that motion fails. Um, with five against and two for. And so we'll move on to item number, I'm sorry, um, you guys have additional comments, I'm not quite, okay. Um, uh, do you have comments on item 31? The motion, the motion was, was, was killed, so I don't think it's appropriate that we continue the conversation. I, I think we've got good direction that this is an item people are interested in continuing to speak on, but I don't think we continue to speak on it right now. I just had a quick question for the city attorney. Go ahead, Tony. So, so Tony, um, I guess what would be the best way for us to bring this? Because it sounds like there's a desire to have discussions around these two topics, and I'm just wondering um, if it's not coming in with the budget, like is there, opportunity to bring this forward at this time through a separate motion, not tying it to the budget, but bringing forward these items for future discussion. That's the whole um, purpose. Is it isn't to the tie to the budget. It's really just, you know, trying to find, and it wasn't clear because since we're talking about personnel, uh, it seemed like talking about new positions would fall this discussion, but since it appears that they don't, but it's related to some of the topics we're discussing what would be the appropriate way for Tony, us to import an item? Tony, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with where we're going. We're, we're being asked to try to make a motion for items that we have no information about at all, about creating a new division, a new position in the city. Um, there's no staff report. There's, that's not even part of our strategic plan. So I'm really trying to, I'm trying to manage, I'm not trying to shut anybody down, but I'm just really trying to manage uh, expectation on, on the agenda today. Um, I think the, the way this is typically done is for um, a, a request to be made uh, either to the mayor or by, by three members of the city council to, to a subsequent agenda. And that doesn't have to be at this meeting. That can be uh, as part of the, you know, in, in the normal course of the work week um, so that the item can be prepared and, and a report can be prepared and, and an appropriate uh, staff recommendation can be brought forward. So that would be my recommendation uh, at this point. Martin Bernal, do you have any comments on that? 
Maybe he's, or Laura. Martine had to step away. Um, I think as far as council policy, what um, City Attorney Condotti reflected is correct as far as being able to make a request because this would be definitely over the eight hour threshold and that would be the process to go through. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to item number 32 now. Um, next up on our agenda is item number 32, resolution to authorize the agreement between the City of Santa Cruz Water Department and the Bank of America for a $50 million line of credit. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, David Baum, our water uh, chief financial officer is um, here to give the presentation. Oh, no, I see Rosemary. That's Rosemary. okay. Um, I was uh, mayor, good afternoon, mayor and council. I'm just gonna introduce David also. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to him. He's got a brief presentation for you. Great. Is that again? I'm having difficulty getting this on the screen. Let me know if you want me to pull it up. Uh, One minute, please. Okay. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm not allowed to share my screen. There you go. Now, now I am. <laughs> Is that working for you, David? Is that? Do you want me to pull it up? Is that on? It should be up. Are you guys able to see his screen? No, we're not. Okay. No. Bonnie, I think it's a good idea for you to pull it up for us, please. Sorry about that. So now it seems to be coming. Okay, there, there we go. It <laughs> there it is. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to give a brief presentation on um, the action before you today is the $50 million line of credit supported by a uh, special counsel, Jones Hall, um, Chick Adams, who is present, and also our financial advisor, Jaime Trejo. And so with that, I'll um, get started. What um, the purpose of this is to provide um, cash for us while we wait for a reimbursement from a revolving fund because as you recall, the city council has approved uh, loans from the state um, revolving fund um, in the amount of $149 million. However, what we've learned is that they're very slow to reimburse us. And so it puts us in a difficult cash position. So move on to the next slide. Um, Again, the, the, as, um, I want to thank you, as you. In your earlier item, you approved the water department's budget, and the capital investment plan is 291 million. Um, as part of that is the 149 million uh, loans from the state, which we find very attractive, four percent for 30 years, and so that's that's really the attractive part. But the the difficult part with these loans has been. The, the time it has taken to get reimbursed. I'll get into that in a minute. So our, um, our first request went in in December for the Newell Creek uh, Dam Inlet Outlet Project. And it was, as you can see on this page, it's a box of 3,000 pages. And they, there, are, there are some nuances about this, this program whereby, for example, it can only be printed on one side and it, it needs to be delivered as paper. Um, it's just a, a way of saying that it's 
it takes time to get reimbursed with all of this, this paperwork that they require. And um, so I thought, you know, showing a picture of all this paper that was in just one filing in December for $23 million, that would be a way to, to, to see for yourself just what a task it is. So here, we, we try to chart this out. Um, again, the cash needed until the state revolving fund pays. So what's here is, is the blue uh, bar on the left is the amount of the claim um, delivered to the state revolving fund in December. That was about $23 million. The, on the right-hand side um, is the, or, are the orange bars. The orange bar represents the, the payment to the water department from the state. And that first claim, um, it was in two parts. One was delivered in 111 days, and the other one was delivered in 94 days, where they say their performance measure is days. And so we had no, we really didn't expect it to take, take so long. And so we really, in March, we, we, we started to get nervous and felt that we, we wanted to reach into the toolbox and one of, the, one of the, the tools in the toolbox was something the water department had done in when it had um, a, it, it obtained a line of credit. And so we thought this is the time to, to go out and seek a line of credit. But what this says also, so the orange is the reimbursement, the gray is the, is the line representing the amount of claims still outstanding. So as of today, uh, we have about 13 million outstanding that you know, we've paid out, but we're waiting to get reimbursed from that loan that was, was given to us by the state. So uh, I'm implementing just a, a real short um, statement here about what it takes. So we're getting a revolving line of credit. It's, um, it's at a lower interest rate than what we could obtain in the long-term market if we said did a, a bond financing. Um, we, again, we, we did this earlier in 2018, and um, we're just doing this because we need some, to make sure that we continue to pay the construction going on in the CIP. We need this to, to stay you know, current. We pay within um, 30 days of getting a request for payments. So we sent out the request for proposals for this revolving line of credit in, in April, and we received um, two responses. We sent 20, we, we, we solicited directly 20 um, institutions. Two of them were in Santa Cruz, one Bay Federal Credit Union and Santa Cruz County Bank, but both of those said that this was a little bit beyond their scope of what they can do. So we ended up having two bids from sort of the usual suspects. And you know, the fact that we only got that it's not that easy to get this, but fortunately Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase were two, two bidders um, that we received. In the, um, the request, we're, we um, are offered a $50 million line of credit. I mean, this is not dissimilar if you're on a home, if you want to um, replace your roof, you might get a line of credit because that's an expensive undertaking. So, that, I mean, this is kind of what this is. And the interest rate is a variable interest rate based on an international index. It's for a three-year period or until we um, receive the reimbursements and then it becomes like a revolving credit facility where we get money from the state and we can pay it back to the bank um, in order to you know, restore the 50 million available to us. And it, it is secured by um, a pledge of the uh, net revenues of the um, wire department. So that would be the uh, operating expenses um, against the total revenue. Um, that's what's pledged to repay this. Uh, we compared um, the two bids, um, the one from Bank of America and the one from JP Morgan and they um, offered uh, similar terms, except that um, primarily J.P. Morgan was kind of kind of more expensive um, in terms of their interest rate, and so we just did this six-month comparison. Uh, the six-month 
apples comparison has a, a B of A um, cost of $92,000 and the similar, um, if we if we drew down 20 million, a, a similar cost for JP Morgan would be $115,250. So it's a pretty um, clear that the B of A was a, a better option for us. Other considerations, um, the Bank of America has uh, a requirement that we would um, establish um, revenues such that we could achieve um, a coverage level of uh, you know $1. ten of net revenue um, for the total debt service um, outstanding. If we wanted to issue more bonds, it would be $1.15, 115% 115 coverage on the max annual debt service of all the outstanding debt in order um, to receive the money from Bank of America under this plan. Um, their legal fees are sort of typical at around $25,000. J.D. Morgan's covenants to us were a little more restrictive um, along the lines of what we already have with our long-term debt. So not only in terms of pricing, but also in terms of covenants, the Bank of America was offering a, a, a better option for us. So um, the next steps would be for the council to approve the line of credit agreement that's part of today's packet and um, the resolution. And um, the plan would be to complete this transaction with Bank of America on the 15th of this month. And we could access the line of credit of $50 million uh, prior to the end of this month. Um, one of the benefits, not only in being able to make the payments but also, um, you know, through the long range financial plan, and it's something we're gonna be updating in the months ahead, um, we have certain targets and certain metrics that we wanna meet. So in this line of credit also helps us to achieve um, our internal targets, such as our coverage level on our debt and um, cash available in our reserves. And the reserves have been used during this time in order to make um, our, meet our obligations. and so. It'll, this will just shore up the, the financial capability of the department during this time. So that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Are there questions from council members on this? I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Um, I, I guess I'll make a comment just state grants and loans um, a lot um, over the years. I mean, this is a fairly uh, normal practice um, it, for government to do, especially when you're looking at the pay, pay timelines like that you demonstrated, David, in one of your slides. Um, so, um, you know, it seems like a prudent thing, and even though it would be wonderful to work with a local institution, it's hard to get that kind of capital, I would imagine, without going to these, um, you know, these bigger firms. So um, thank you for the presentation. Um, if there's no questions from um, council, I'll go ahead and bring it out to public for public comment. So if you're interested in commenting on, or, excuse me, or back up. If you are interested in commenting on resolution on the resolution to authorize the agreement between the City of Santa Cruz Water Department and Bank of America for a $50 million line of credit, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I see we have um, phone number ending in 1810. You're unmuted and you should be able to talk. Yeah, this is Garrett again. Hey, item 32 seeks to give business to Bank of America. In 2020, Bank of America paid out $16.65 billion in a historic Justice Department settlement for financial fraud leading up to and during the financial crisis, the largest civil se settlement with a single entity in American history. In 2019, Bank of America agreed to pay $75 million to sell a lawsuit this U.S. bank of extracting overdraft fees it didn't earn from customers. They also paid $4.2 million to settle government allegations of race and sex bias in hiring locations in four states. In 2018, a $42 million settlement with Bank of America occurred 
over what it called the masking strategy, which was applied to 16 million client trade orders between 2008 and 2013, representing over 4 billion traded shares. Bank of America undisclosed agreements with electronic trading firms Citadel Securities, Knight Capital, DE Shaw, Two Sigma Securities, and you guessed it, Madoff Securities to handle the trades instead. In 2017, Bank of America agreed to pay $66.6 million to end the lawsuit accusing it of collecting unlawfully high rates of interest styled as fees from customers who let their checking accounts stay overdrawn for several days. I could go endlessly on. You must surely get the idea that they never learn and they never pay the real price, which is jail. The mega banks, and B of A is one of them, is number two in mega banking, but they're number one in paying for misdeeds. Don't play by civil rules or play fair. Get caught all the time, hand slapped, and short memory types of all kinds look the other way and continue to fund their misdeeds. There must be banks without continuous malintent settlements. Just an idea, find one. And I don't mean a socialist public bank. And Chase isn't that much different. Thanks. Okay, seeing no other members of the public, I will bring it back to council and look for a motion. Um, grab my. Okay, I see council member Golden. I'm happy to move the item. I do agree with um, Garrett Phillips, though, that I, I think possible we should, you know, bank local, but I understand the circumstances aren't allowing for this, so I'm happy to move the item. Thank you. And council member Colin Tari Johnson? A second. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member Holder, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson to um, for the resolution to authorize the agreement between the City of Santa Cruz Water Department and Bank of America for a $50 million line of credit. And I would ask for a roll call vote, please. Um, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myron? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, we're running just a little bit early. I'd like to just take a five minute break so we can just uh, use the facilities and we'll come back at about 4.05, uh, 4.10 and restart. We have two additional items on our agenda this afternoon and then um, we'll have our evening session starting at six tonight. So we'll just take a 10 minute break. Please come back at 4.10, thank you. Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, uh, next up is item uh, item number 33, uh, the ordinance amending chapters 10.64, 10.65, and 4.02 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code pertaining to special events. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to come on, comment on, it's the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, I have Lindsay Bass, uh, our principal management analyst in our Parks and Recreation Department. As Good afternoon, thank you, um, Mayor and Council.
council members, I'm going to share my screen and um, appreciate your time and review of our requested updates to three ordinances that govern the work that we do to permit a variety of city special events. Um, as you all know, the Parks and Recreation Department has long been permitting events in our spaces and places, um, which means that we bring a good deal of experience and knowledge to this discipline. Um, however, we expanded um, the scope of our work in January 2020 when the department added to its responsibility uh, permitting for the following uh, special events. Let's see, let me get this into presentation mode for you. Um, so uh, when the responsibility from the city manager's office um, with the transition of the special events coordinator position over to Parks and Recreation, um, that meant that we added to our portfolio of permitting uh, public major special events, public minor events, gathering and expression permits, neighborhood block parties, as well as film permits. You can see some examples here chart to give you a sense of what types of events fall into those categories. Um, with these new permit responsibilities came municipal code chapters that provide specific orders and how we are to permit in the case of 1064 public um, major special events um, and in the case of 1065 gathering and expression events. In both cases, the purpose of these chapters is to promote public safety and welfare and to provide the city with time to logistically accommodate the activity that is being suggested. Further, in the case of 1065, there is an additional aim to assure that First Amendment rights of those who wish to peacefully participate in public gathering and expression events in our city um, are preserved and protected, and it also assures the reasonable access to public property by other community members not involved in the event. The third ordinance included in your packet is 4.02.021, which ensures the permit officer within the department has the ability to issue citations for permit noncompliance if the director so desires. So um, in your packet is um, a way of changes and what was driving those changes was the fact that um, in many instances, there were just a variety of updates that needed to be made. So we focused our efforts to modify um, the ordinances to reflect the transition of responsibility. So in many cases, the ordinances refer to the city manager's office, refers to the city manager um, or city council as the governing body um, most closely aligned to the city manager's office. So uh, we uh, transitioned that to the Parks and Recreation Department in many cases um, and to our um, uh, appointed um, uh, subcommittee of the council, which is the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, so you'll see those updates throughout um, in the red line document. We also looked to update language where it was outdated. Um, so there were um, outdated um, pieces uh, around insurance, indemnification language, um, also just in terms of um, uh, accessibility. So those are just some examples of where we made um, language. Um, but more importantly, the third element that we focused on was modifying areas of the purpose and the def definitions to promote more clarity. Um, so in some cases, there were redundancies in the code um, that could lead to um, just you know, confusion or uh, were just unnecessary. So we really tried to work with the city attorney's office to streamline and clarify um, those areas of the code, as well as to clarify certain definitions um, or to add definitions that were now germane um, with the transition of authority to our department. Um, the final major area of update that we looked at was uh, around the appeals process. Um, and uh, that basically creates two pathways for appeals in um, the permit work that we do. Uh, the first pathway aligns with our standard department appellate process, um, which is managed through the Parks and Recreation Commission Secretary, which is a staff member um, within the department. Uh, and then a second pathway for an expedited appeals process. And so um, the nature of events is that 
times and the nature of our commission meetings is that they may not line up. And so we wanted there to be a process where um, that uh, event producer could appeal in an expedited fashion and have their issue resolved um, more quickly in line with the timeline for the event. Um, and that would be received and decided by the city manager. Um, and a good, this piece, the appellate piece, received a good amount of focus um, from the commission um, when they heard this item. And so uh, I just want to make a special note that um, it's important for us to convey that uh, event appeals are very, very rare. Um, while we've only been um, overseeing the special event uh, uh, permitting process uh, shortly, um, the person in that role uh, prior to our taking it over uh, could only remember one instance where there was um, an appeal. So, um, and hopefully this process provides enough flexibility. Um, before I close and open it up to questions, I did just want to give you guys a little bit of an overview of um, the process that we took um, to review and recommend the updates that are coming to you today. Um, so from January to September of last year, as I mentioned, this role transitioned to our department. And um, over that time, we became much more familiar with the ordinances, came to understand areas that required um, the updating that uh, we flagged earlier. Um, we were able to talk with folks about particular weaknesses and how we could address that within the given language and where we couldn't. Um, we then, from September to March of this year, um, made updates to the ordinance in draft form and then took those to the commission and the public for feedback in early March of this year. That was incredibly helpful. I find that the commission review and comments in detail are part of your packet. I do want to note they're mislabeled as attachment seven. They are attachment five, so apologies for any confusion um, there. Um, but we did work through those comments um, from the commission and the public um, as we worked with the city attorney's office to do a final update and of uh, the ordinances. So uh, what is coming to you today is the product of um, that review work that we did from March through June um, with Tony Condotti's team. Um, so with that, I will, um, close for your questions and comments. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to bring this before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I'll go ahead if um, any of the council members have questions on this item. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, there was a lot of red to read through, but um, I'm glad that it was given this attention to detail. I know Kathy was for many years in this role, and so um, updating it and keeping it current was necessary. Thank you for the work that went into it and to the commission as well. Um, I My question is related, um, received some correspondence from a constituent, um, and I'm wondering about the best way to ensure that um, um, there's flexibility to ensure that um, uh, events don't disrupt quality of life for residents and um, with certain events, um, that can be the case. And so, um, you know, giving uh, the balance with the needs of the residents and um, the permit process. And so um, I'm just wondering what direction would be most helpful um, and how, if, if already it is incorporated um, in any of, any of the changes made. Um, and I think every event is going to be its own um, situation. I know each event requires so many different moving parts 
And so it's hard to blanket uh, one rule or ordinance or system um, given that each event can just vary. And so wondering um, how, how we can incorporate direction and language that allows for an assessment of um, the needs that really balance the quality of life in a neighborhood or, or um, and, and, and I can reference um, this one specific email that was very, gave very specific recommendations for one event mm -hmm. um, as an example. So that's, that's my question. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question, and it's something that was flagged when we went to the commission as well. And the ordinance as written does allow um, for us to be able to evaluate and modify um, uh, in a number of different ways. So the first thing that we do when we're assessing a permit is we always evaluate it based on time, place, and manner. And so we're always using that as an assessment of, you know, how to place conditions on that permit in a way that does strike that balance that you just. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, uh, Chapter 10.64.1.5 allows action <laughs> on a, <laughs> Sorry, I rattled that off very quickly. Yes, you did. I love it. Can you say um, that one more time, please? Yes, absolutely. 10.64.150. <laughs> One five zero. Okay. Is action on application and um, section D of that does allow the director to promulgate administrative policies and procedures that govern okay. the issuance of a permit. So we can, um, if needed, um, issue policies and procedures that will help further balance the impacts of major events, resources to manage the events, as well as the needs of residents. So we do have okay. that ability to do so within the ordinance. Further, Chapter 10.64.230 um, is the section on permit conditions. And so that lays out like all the different ways that we are able to condition an event. Um, and so that gives the permit officer a good amount of discretion. And the permit does take past feedback into account. And so when this came to the commission, we did encourage folks to make sure to send that feedback to you, you as a body, the city council, to us, to the commissioners, um, so that that information gets funneled to the permit officer and can be placed in the file for that event. And so if that event comes back to us, we can use um, that performance as a measure of how to place conditions on. Um, and public feedback is always really, really helpful and appreciated for how we can make these events um, better and better balanced, um, to your point. The final piece is that um, we, in the ordinance, there are uh, provisions around notification mm -hmm. of residents that will be affected. And mm -hmm. we uh, know that that's an area where um, under our jurisdiction now, um, we think that we can modernize that to help um, folks gain better access to events that will be happening in their area. Mm -hmm. um, and also take a look to make sure that we're doing our due diligence with the event producers that they're following through on the notification that they are required to do as part of receiving that event. Um, so that's an area um, in the last slide that I showed once we have um, the blessing of council um, on uh, the updates to the ordinance, um, and you all may have some changes for us, but um, part of that uh, piece of work that we'll do next is to focus on process improvements and to make sure that you know we have a good dialed in effort to um, ensure that we're meeting the community's needs as we permit these events. Great. I, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, I'd like to recommend that some of those um, details are incorporated for sure. And um, this one email from uh, Anita Webb um, really specifically calls out the notification process 
um, to include two advance notices, for example, and that road closures and detours that block access to or from entry driveways um, have a two to three week advance notice and a 72 hour advance written notice to each doorstep. And um, I think um, if we can make sure that those recommendations are included in the language, that would be really helpful. The only question I, I, that I would give on that is I would think we can absolutely do that um, in uh, events where those uh, can be present. And we can do that as uh, through the authority that the ordinance provides for us. Okay. So that's part of incorporating that um, feedback from the public into our evaluation of the events. I would, want, I, I would caution putting that into the ordinance language just because it might create right. a requirement for us to do that. Every, that's right. receiving a permit under this ordinance. And some of them are not that big or may not hit that threshold. And for that reason, um, it would uh, create an added layer of um, paperwork and uh, bureaucracy potentially. Um, but we will, we are absolutely open to a recommendation from the council to incorporate things like that into policy procedures that govern um, the work that we do around permits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, understanding that, uh, yeah, each event is very different. And um, so incorporating it into the policies and procedures. Um, Okay, great. That uh, answers my question. Oh, I had one one thought is, um, are there follow-up um, surveys ever done with events? Um, like, how did it go? What did you experience? And pros and cons. And that way, for those regular types of events, there's um, tweaks that can be made for the following year, the, the next time. Yeah, that's a um, salient comment, a great one. It's something that we've got three outstanding people that um, are tackling aspects of this permit work in the department, and that's one area that they've started talking about. So this hasn't been done historically, but we see it as an opportunity um, for all the reasons that uh, mentioned that we want community feedback to improve events, but we also want event producer feedback to improve our mm -hmm. event process. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at ways to incorporate that into our process and ways to automate that. So um, Tremaine Hedden Jones, um, who is managing a lot of um, this for us and is also our tech guru in the department, <laughs> um, is looking at how we can um, leverage uh, other systems in the city to potentially help streamline this and facilitate um, like the sending out of evaluations to event producers post event and being able to keep that type of um, learnings um, in house so that we can um, move towards continuous improvement. Great. And Trey's on the line. If Trey, if you have any other comments on that piece that you want to add, feel free. It looks like my video stuck, but um, I'm here, um, Council. Uh, yes, we are trying to incorporate a couple of different changes once the does go through. Uh, the first being actually developing um, a special event brochure slash guide, um, similar to the City of San Francisco's guide on producing special events within the city. They have the various agencies involved, as well as the various districts and neighborhoods involved with producing special events. It goes through the entire um, lineup in terms of the application process and procedures, as well as any ancillary permits that may be required. That's uh, similar to our city as well. In addition, we'd like to have a post-event evaluation form, which would essentially be a survey that would go out to the producer of the event, as well as any uh, other community respondents. And um, over time, we hope to collect that information, and as Lindsay has, and Lindsay has mentioned, use that to help um, better cater events and also create events for our community. Thanks, Trey. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, by the way. Uh, I, I, thank you. Uh, 
I, I just wanted to uh, thank Vice Mayor uh, Bruner for, for bringing those thoughts up. I, I, I share concerns and, and definitely uh, the letter that we received resonated. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering if, um, because as, as we know, uh, events are, are very different in different parts of town and di for different purposes and different numbers of people, different times, all of those things. Um, but there are some, and in particular, the one that was discussed in that communication is a really intensive event. And so I'm just wondering if um, you've contemplated the possibility of, uh, in addition to noticing, trying to do some kind of Con have a conversation or, um, you know, a, create a space for approximate to that who are who just are going to be affected in these ways and it's kind of can't be helped if the event's happening. Um, you know, thoughts on how, their thoughts on how to ameliorate the impact. Um, so I don't know if it's possible to contemplate that in the case of like major events and disruptions related to those events. Yeah, Council Member Brown, that's a great point. Thank you for raising it. Um, and I think we as a department take, you know, community concerns very seriously. And I think your uh, note that they can also be um, the repositories of great solutions, you know, because they have lived through these events year to year. Um, and we should be tapping um, them for ideas. And I think that's definitely something that um, we do want to do. There's absolutely an appetite. Um, I will just mention um, the uh, process for the department to onboard this new responsibility has been fraught and delayed. Um, we recruited and hired someone who then left, and then we had to eliminate the position, and we've spread those responsibilities out across the staff. And so we are a little behind in where we would like to be in terms of um, feeling like we're more on a proactive footing. The pandemic didn't help that at all, um, uh, just creating a lot of additional curveballs for us to address. But we are getting um, back on our toes with respect to these things, and I think we do um, intend to reach out to um, neighborhoods and community members. We have already done a bit of a location analysis of events for 2019 as well, just to kind of understand, like, where are these events landing in different neighborhoods? So who are those neighborhood communities that are seeing a lot of this activity? And so I think that will help drive those conversations of where we go say, hey, you know, how is this going? Can we make some improvements? This is what we've heard. Help us understand how to make that better. Um, so I think as, as we get um, uh, organized and uh, utilize these analyses, we'll definitely get into that. I would just ask um, for your patience as we work through that, just given um, uh, staffing constraints at the moment. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I want. I just want to say. I. I mean, you have a lot on your plate, all of you, and <laughs> we totally recognize that. And so, this is just kind of a question for kind of a longer term how we handle these, uh, you know, these processes. So, I, I really appreciate your thinking on it and your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay. Um, I, is there any other council members with questions at all? Hand. Okay, I'll take this out to the public now. Uh, so this will be, um, if you're interested in commenting on the ordinance amending chapters 10.64, 10.65, and 4.02 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code per pertaining to special events, please press star nine on, the on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. It doesn't look like we have anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item, so I will bring it back to council for a motion, please. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. I move to introduce for publication an ordinance amending chapters 10.64, 10.65, and 4.02 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to special events. Great. And Council Member Cummings? Second it. Great. Okay, 
Okay, I have a, <clears throat> a motion um, approving ordinance amending chapters 10.61 uh, pertaining, excuse me, um, I won't read it all, pertaining to special events here in the city. Um, and I will ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. Oh. And Mayor Myers. Uh, aye. That motion passes unanimously. Did you catch um, Council Member Boulder or was she muted? Bonnie? I No, she was muted, but she kind of cut out mid okay. word. Got I caught it. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. We will now move on to item number 34 on our general business agenda. This is the resolution authorizing the renaming of locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson to accurately depict the history of Mr. Members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return the council's deliberation and action. Uh, I'd like to invite up Rachel Kaufman, our recreation superintendent for the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, city council members. You have quite a Parks and Rec agenda here today, so you get to see <laughs> all of us a lot. <laughs> so uh, today we're bringing back to the council the question of correcting the name of locations and landmarks honoring Lauda Nelson to London Nelson. Um, and as before, when I presented, um, since the name of Mr. Nelson, just for clarity in the presentation, we'll refer to him as Mr. Nelson. Um, and joining me as panelists today for the presentation um, are uh, Brittany London Potter, the person who launched the petition on change.org to correct the name of the community center Santa Cruz Equity Project founder, Luna Bay, local historian, Ross Gibson, the Loudon Nelson Community Center Supervisor, Isa Ray, the Civic Supervisor, and the City Liaison to the Ofrenda at the Town Clock, Jesse Bond. And so all were a part of the project team that was formed in December with the task of researching and discussing this topic. And I just wanted to note other members of the project team were Brenda Griffin, current NAACP president, Anna Martin, who is a key organizer of the Juneteenth Celebration in Lowell Park, as you heard over the last 30 years that it's been happening, and uh, city council member Justin Cummings. So included again in the agenda packet are historical documents and articles uh, which both affirm the complex history of Mr. Nelson's name and show the community's struggle really with how to appropriately honor his contributions to the city. And so uh, before getting started, just wanted to um, clarify this recommendation, although uh, Mayor Myers just read that for you, um, what you uh, will be voting on today. So on April 13th, we came to you and asked the council to adopt a resolution just endorsing the community's effort to explore the re of locations and landmarks honoring um, Loudon Nelson to London Nelson and pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz. We also, um, uh, so, uh, you direct the Historic Preservation Commission to place an item on the May 19th agenda, the name correction, and then bring back a recommendation. So after taking the item to the Historic Preservation Commission and receiving unanimous support for changing the name, which I will expand upon in a moment, uh, today we are bringing this item back and asking to uh, adopt the resolution of the following that the Santa Cruz City Council approve uh, renaming locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson and specifically the Loudon Nelson Community Center and pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and again explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz. So that's what we're, we're here to discuss today. 
And this conversation began with a petition, as I noted, by community member Brit uh, Brittany London Potter that she launched on change.org to rename the Loudon Nelson Community Center the London Nelson Center. And the petition reached over 1,300 signatures and is still active online. Uh, Brittany was unable to attend the last pres uh, presentation, as you remember, because she had just given birth to her son, but I'm happy to say she's able to join us today. And I would, at this time, like her to um, share her screen and her own words, the inspiration uh, behind the petition. So Brittany, if you're there, I invite you to... Um, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Council, thank you so much for considering this this agenda. Um, sorry if it's a little bit windy. I, I'm actually currently at the boardwalk with my son, so I promised him that we would go today. So I'm, I'm flipped to the beach and I'm hiding in a corner trying to trying to do this meeting. So I apologize if you hear a little bit of noise and maybe some screams. Um, but as Rachel just just said, yes. So um, the community center has always been like a huge, huge, huge uh, part of my life. Um, I actually remember the day when my mom actually told me she was like, oh, just so you you know that this center right here um, is actually named after like one of the first black men to show up in Santa Cruz, and his name's actually not loud, and it's London. And then we just like kept walking. I was probably like eight or so at the time, and I remember always feeling like really slighted, like okay, like we know his name is not correct, um, and yet no one does anything about it. You know, we don't call Jack O'Neill John O'Neill. You know, we give we give the credit where the credit's due. Um, and so in the midst of the pandemic last year, I really got to thinking like what's a positive thing that I can do for our community, meaning the black community? Um, and that was the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, I've always gone there for like friends' birthday parties for um, um, <laughs> Juneteenth every year. I, that's just something that I always remember. I always remember being welcome to there. Um, and sometimes on the way home, I would have to use the phone. And I remember popping into the center and just asking, can I use the phone? Can I use the restroom? Um, and never being turned away and never being looked at funny. Um, I, you know, am a black woman in a predominantly white area. The center always made me feel extremely welcome. Um, and so, that being said, I, I thought, why not correct this, you know, this, this mislabeled history? Um, I reached out to Rachel after starting the petition, and it just kind of took, you know, took off from there. And I am elated that it, you know, it's, it's come this far um, in a short amount of time. But, you know, as Rachel and you'll soon, soon hear, Mr. Nelson was um, a and, and I, I think um, with the center, along with his gravestone and the other landmarks that are mislabeled, they all need to reflect um, who he was, and, and this will also create dialogue for the community, and the community will also um, really know who Mr. Nelson was and is. And that's why, you know, I started the petition, and that's why I, or I think uh, the name center deserves a, a change. Great, thank you, Brittany. And always, always a, a loyal mom there, right? <laughs> through and through. Keep your through promise through. to your son. Yes, exactly. <laughs> mom first. Um, and so, uh, considering the complex history and you know ongoing kind of community dialogue of the name of the community center, as you know, um, our. Uh, project team of the people I previously mentioned was assembled to research the history and discuss potential next steps. And so in January and February 2021, the group held four meetings to if and how to move forward with the renaming of locations and landmarks. And um, items discussed at these meetings included review of the historical evidence, uh, the opposition by the black community in 1984, the various locations where Mr. Nelson is honored and what further effort you know, should be pursued to educate the community on Mr. Nelson's legacy. And when we originally presented um, this item at council, we really reviewed the history in detail. And while we won't go into as great a detail this time, we still feel there are many folks who are watching who it, you know, maybe they missed the first presentation. And we always see this as an opportunity to share with the community both the history of Mr. Nelson and his renaming, misnaming. So I will go into a little of, of that now. Um, and so Mr. Nelson was born into slavery in 1800 on a cotton plantation. And in 1850, after news of the gold rush, Mr. Nelson was taken from the plantation by a slave owner to California. 
and Mr. Nelson was uh, um, eventually able to purchase his freedom from enslavement. And after becoming a free man, he arrived in Santa Cruz in 1856 and leased a cabin along the San Lorenzo River. And he farmed the land and sold the produce in addition to working as a cobbler. He was eventually able to purchase the cabin and a plot of land from the owner, Mr. James L. Pruitt. And in April of 1860, Mr. Nelson fell terminally ill and he did die in May of 1860. Uh, Dr. Asa Rawson recorded Mr. Nelson's oral will upon his deathbed. And also present was Mr. Nelson's friend and local businessman, Elihu Anthony who served as witness to the oral dedication in which Mr. Nelson bequeathed all of his belongings to the local schools. Um, a year later, after Dr. Ross, uh, Rawson's own demise, Mr. Uh, Anthony served as executor of Mr. Nelson's estate. And just note the school district later sold the land, which provided the school board the means to demolish the small Mission Hill School um, buy an adjoining Mission Hill lot and construct a four-story Italian with a small high school in the attic. And today, this property is the site of the Santa Cruz City Schools Administrative Office at 133 Mission Street. So at this time, I'll um, share my screen as, and just show um, a photo of the Mission Hill School in 1972, and then also where the city school administration offices are now in 2021. So this is the site that was purchased with the sale of Mr. Nelson's property. And um, the contribution to the city is significant, and uh, many groups over time have looked to honor Mr. Nelson's generosity and support for education. But the question um, became the name, you know, to use to honor his contributions. And his name is both recorded as London and Loudon Nelson, as well as other misspellings. And again, we are lucky to have local historian Ross Gibson here to talk more about the various names of Mr. Nelson. And um, he presented um, these slides before, but I thought worth sharing again, um, uh, as they are the kind of definitive evidence that we feel is compelling that make it, you know, us feel his name was London Nelson. So um, Ross, I invite you to um, speak at this time and I'll share these slides. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Phil, Phil Reeder did the original research on London Nelson, traveling throughout the South to collect documents that told part of his story. He showed that Owner William Nelson named his enslaved workers after English cities, London, Canterbury, Marlborough, and Cambridge. At the Santa Cruz County Courthouse, Reader assembled around 50 documents, half of which were copied a second time as a negative in efforts to read the difficult handwriting. So in the 75 documents, we learn that during Nelson's life and shortly after his death, all documents refer to him as London Nelson. Yet probate did not close until 1875, 15 years after his death, by which time most who knew him were gone or had forgotten. Thus the written record became all the more important, yet the poor penmanship is either London or Loudon, and clerks definitely started spelling it Loudon. Next slide. One of the probate documents was written by Dr. William Slocum, clerk of the probate court and editor of the Santa Cruz News. And he included a clipping of the newspaper probate notice, which easily shows referring to the estate of London Nelson, handwriting notwithstanding. Next slide. This wasn't the only time poor penmanship had changed his name here we see his handwriting name has also been interpreted as Shannon Nelson on a mining document, London Nielsen on a deed, Lyndon Nelson in one Sentinel article, and Ludlow Wilson in one SERP article. 
So with this wide variation of interpreting his name, how can we be sure his real name is London? Next slide. The survey of sources shows all newspaper articles in 1860 and 1861 refer to him as London when they give a first name. This corroborates the handwritten documents. Yet after probate closed in 1875, the poor penmanship evolved into deliberately spelling his name Loudon, upon which the inscription on his tombstone was based when erected in 1876. Yet even with Mission Hill students honoring his legacy and tending a grave that reads Loudon, and historians continued to insist that his real name was London. These include historian Leon Rowland in articles and books, and Margaret Koch in Santa Cruz County Parade of the Past called him London Nelson, also known as Loudon Nelson. Next slide. Determined that his last will and testament was the closest thing to the man himself confirming his name was London Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. And on uh, May 19th, by direction from the City Council, the project team presented this item, including Ross's slides, to the Historic Preservation Commission. And the Historic Preservation uh, Commission voted unanimously to support changing the name of the community center, as well as other locations and landmarks from Loudon Nelson to London Nelson. And included in their motion to approve the name change was a request for the project team to return to the Historic Preservation Commission in the fall to provide an update on our progress. And so in doing so, the commissioners wanted to make the correction of the community center a priority as well as correcting the other locations and landmarks. And during the discussion portion of the meeting, Commissioner Bliss inquired about possibly pursuing recognition of other African Americans buried in Evergreen Cemetery, similar to the uh, Chinese Memorial Gate that was installed in 2014 to honor Santa Cruz's early Chinese immigrants. And um, Luna Bay has been working with the Ma on both correcting Mr. Nelson's grave marker and associated plaque, as well as efforts related to honoring other African Americans buried in Evergreen. And given Commissioner Bliss's comments, before council today of the further education efforts. At this time, um, I wanted to invite Luna Bay up to share just a little more about this current work with the Ma at Evergreen and how um, we'll be moving forward. So Luna, if you wanna uh, jump on now and I'll share my screen again um, to go through some slides. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, We'd love to share with you all some of the things we have been doing and some of our future plans. Um, so as you see, this is the uh, London Nelson um, grave marker. His name is spelled um, incorrectly on the uh, on the tombstone. Um, the placard that was on top of them has been removed um, at the request, at my personal request, at the request of it as well. Um, as we did not feel that it was uh, fair to have the name of the person who enslaved him over top of his body. Um, the museum has been very, very um, receptive to that request. They have removed it, and I'm currently working with them um, to create new language uh, to go on that plaque to accurately honor his legacy and his memory as an individual person and not solely as an enslaved person. So next slide. Rachel, you want to move to the next slide? Yes. So uh, we did an event um, at the um, at the Evergreen Cemetery to honor uh, the other people who are buried there. We know that there are at least uh, six other people buried there. But we have an extra spot for the unknown and the unnamed. Um, I believe that there's a possibility that there are more people there, as this was a potter's field, and uh, that probably would have been buried there if they were not allowed to be buried at Santa Cruz Memorial. Um, this work has been a personal passion project uh, for me as a person who deeply uh, is connected to ancestral work and ancestral veneration. Um, I was asked to do this project in conjunction with the Ten Year World Dance and Cultural Center and their Santa Cruz Black Health Matters Initiative, along with the MOF. And we are working on continued efforts to honor their legacy. 
Uh, we have something that is, we're working on the Lemon Nelson Research and Restoration Proposal, where we're proposing um, six different further um, actions. The first one we would like rejuvenate, we'd like to rejuvenate and re-engage with the research around Mr. Nelson. Historical data to be interpreted by a black research group. Um, we would like further gravestone and uh, who are there and markers similar to what is at the Chinese Memorial, which is in line with what Commission of Books um, asked for us to do. Um, we'd also like an information placard placed there visiting our aware of what they're looking for and possibly have this information in a rejuvenated heritage hall at the London Nelson Community Center or, and or a special um, exhibit at the mall uh, with this information about black pioneers in Santa Cruz. We also would love to see a mural placed downtown within the boundaries of Mr. Nelson's property to his contribution to the city. Um, the mural in the high school to be rejuvenated and to engage with the uh, with the school board on making a black pioneers part of the curriculum there. So uh, this is all this is all this is the work prior to Commissioner Bush's uh, uh, comments. But uh, it's wonderful to see how everything has aligned, and hopefully, as I and the Ma and uh, Black Health Masters Initiative uh, coalesce and, and bring this proposal into fruition, I would love to re-engage council about the way this city would like to participate and engage in this process. Thank you, Luna. And then in addition to Mr. Nelson's grave marker in Evergreen Cemetery, Mr. Nelson is recognized at uh, Loudon Nelson Plaza, which is by the city school administrative building, you know, with um, a monument there, um, as well as, as Luna referred to, mural at Mission Hill Middle School. And I have kept city administrators and city school superintendent Chris Monroe up to date on this effort to correct Mr. Nelson's name. And at the last city school board meeting, I believe it was on Wednesday, June 3rd, the school board unanimously passed a resolution 38-20-21 titled Renaming Locations and Landmarks Bring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson. And it was resolved that the Santa Cruz uh, City School District supports the name correction and commits to correct the name of Mr. Nelson at city school district locations. And so um, that because that happened last week, it wasn't able to make the agenda report, but I'll make sure that city council members um, are able to see and support from the Santa Cruz School District. And so finally, just considering all the information today, the project team is asking city council for a final recommendation that the Santa Cruz City Council approve renaming locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson, specifically the Loudon Nelson Community Center and pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on his contributions to Santa Cruz. And just wanna highlight that this item before council strongly supports the health and all policy pillar of equity. As we strive for historical accuracy of Mr. Nelson's achievements, we emphasize the importance of community connectedness, diverse representation and cultural life and a sense of belonging. And so with that, that is uh, our presentation and just happy to stay on uh, for questions or comments from council. Thanks very much, um, Rachel. And um, thank you to um, everyone involved. I will go ahead and see if um, council has uh, questions or comments at this. Council member Goldie. Thank you to everybody who worked on this um, as a team, I think it's really important uh, to to m make these corrections to reflect the historical um, inaccuracies that, that have been perpetuated through decades, and, and restore um, Mr. Nelson to you know, to London Nelson or Bob Nelson to remember him as he has these names. And I'm happy to move that resolution as written in our past. Thanks, guys. See if someone has a second to the motion. Oh, I think still has to go for public comment. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank Sorry. You. Oh, oops. oops. Back to that. Um, Council Member Watkins, do you have a comment or question? I, 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 I was just going to second the motion, but I also know we need to go to public comment. Um, I just really want to 
I don't have a question, but I'll maybe take the opportunity just to make a really short comment, just to express my gratitude and appreciation for all those who, from the beginning conversation to initiating it, to the work that was done in terms of the research, to the next steps to further this movement of really having accurate history um, restored and the importance of that. And I um, just also wanna highlight how uh, individuals are policymakers in their own right. And this is a really great example of really um, mobilizing the community for change. So just a huge shout out to Brittany and to Luna and to those who um, really worked with the city, worked with the community and brought this to uh, fruition and now into um, being an instituted change policy. So super huge and incredible congratulations and um, thank you so much. This is just a wonderful presentation, great, great example of really important work. So thank you. Take this out to the public now. So if you are interested in commenting today on item number 34 on our agenda, which is the resolution authorizing the renaming of locations and landmarks honoring Loudon Nelson to London Nelson, to accurately depict your Nelson, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I'm looking at our attendees and I'm not seeing anyone with their hand up, so I will bring it back to council. We do have a motion on the floor to approve um, the staff uh, recommendation, which is a resolution affecting locations and landmarks honoring Mr. Nelson and to pursue um, specifically the renaming of um, Loudon Nelson to London Nelson Center, Payne Center, pursue a more accurate depiction of the history of Mr. Nelson and explore further education efforts on Mr. Nelson's contribution to the sentence. Uh, I have Council Member Brown, Council Member Colin Perry Johnson, and Council Member Sunny. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you so much. This is really just to express my, my gratitude to uh, members of the community, Luna and Brittany and others who worked with you uh, to bring this to the city. Uh, I think this is just an amazing example of uh, when, how community members can initiate, uh, you know, issue, initiate projects and, and bring things before the, the city um, and be heard. And you know the work that, and I want to thank the Parks and Rec Department and, and uh, Council Member Cummings and everybody who, uh, at our end, at the city end, responded and created the space to make this happen. Um, so uh, you know it's been it's a long time coming. I'm really happy it's here today. And uh, Luna and Brittany, I think Brittany's off now. Hopefully on the Giant Dipper or something. Um, uh, your, your work, it's really inspiring. So thank you. Councilmember Colin Perry Johnson. Yes, I would also like to express my thanks to everyone involved in this project. I won't name all the names because they've been named. Um, really appreciate, um, really appreciate honoring diversity in our in our past, and I think it really um, sets us sets us on a on a um, on a path we need to to honor diversity, equity, and inclusion as we move forward as a um, so thank you to everyone who worked on it. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but just want to thank everyone uh, who's been involved in this and, you know, just seeing it go from a petition online to really become a collaborative working um, group that really, you know, tried to hear everyone out and, and figure out the forward and determine how we were going to come to the conclusion that we're at today. And so, um, I just want to thank uh, the community members and city staff for all their hard work. I know Rachel was really instrumental for organizing the group and keeping everybody moving forward. So thank you so much for all of your help with the city. And to um, yeah, to the point that Councilman Brown made and to other colleagues, it's, I think it's a really good opportunity for members of the public to see how, you know, reaching out to the city, you know, forming collaborative relationships and figuring out how we can work together can really have positive, uh, tangible outcomes. And so really looking forward to figuring out how we can continue to bring these kinds of items forward and really, um, you know, have a government that is, you know, by and for the people. 
Thanks, Mayor Bruner. Thank you uh, to Rachel and thank you to Brittany for bringing this forward. It's amazing what a year can bring. And um, it's nice to see smiles on everyone's faces um, for this type of movement. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, and Luna, thank you. You touched on some of the work that is still continuing, and I hope we can look at all of our our rich, diverse history in Santa Cruz and how we may continue to honor and acknowledge, um, you know, that history in in accurate ways whenever there are inaccuracies and. Um, so thank you so much for all the work through this past year up until this point. And this is really a historical moment. It's huge. And it will go down in the history books, which is pretty amazing. Um, so thank you to everyone involved in this process. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Luna. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, uh, Justin. You were involved, too, and um, Parks and Rec Department. My thanks as well. And yeah, I, I think the vice mayor really summed it up nicely. You guys have made history. And um, I think you have um, council members that are in full support of your efforts to continue to document the history um, of, um, you know, uh, the history of, of folks who have been here in Santa Cruz. And it's really important that that history be revealed and that those. Um, those memorials be, um, you know, be properly displayed and taken care of and honored in our community. So um, thank you so much for all your work. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see. So congratulations on what you guys have done. So um, we have a motion uh, and we'll go ahead and do um, a roll call vote. And again, congratulations and thanks to everyone for your work. Oh, did you have one more comment? Was there, was there a second to the motion? We didn't have a motion by um, uh, cool. Council Member Cold or seconded by Council Member Watt. Okay, I didn't hear the second. Thank you. Okay, Council we'll Member do a Watt. Aye. Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brun? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Congratulations and thanks again, everyone. Uh, it is 5 o'clock, 5.09, and uh, we are going to recess until 6 o'clock where we will um, our evening session and we'll have oral communications followed by item number um, 35 at that time. So we'll be in recess until 6 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hi everybody, Sonia, we got a lunch break and a dinner break in. <laughs> no promises after this meeting. <laughs> One day to stop. Can I just share that my boys made dinner tonight? <laughs> That's great. Like real dinner, rice and salmon. <laughs> my niece making salmon, or making <laughs> So 
Sonia, I see you on camera, but I also see you on the phone. Are you on phone too? Um, that was my previous device that um, uh, okay. no yeah, worries. was shut down. No worries. Thanks. Remember, I was having technical difficulties earlier. So. Right. so council members could turn on their cameras. We're going to go ahead and get started. We've got her. There's Sandy. Um, Martine's back. Martini, Justin's here. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I will go ahead and call the evening session to order. Welcome to our 6 p.m. session of the June 8, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment during oral communications or during this evening's agenda item, call in using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone and to raise your hand when it is time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Here. Calentari Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Boulder. Here. Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. Mayor Myers. Present. We'll now move on to oral communications for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. In addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your name. Please remember that this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address questions raised after oral communications has been completed. I will look uh, for members of the public who are here this evening to talk to us as um, part of oral communications. This is for items not on our agenda. I see a phone number ending in 1810, please. Yeah, California has a problem where some, not all minorities don't score very well on standard achievement tests or drop out because too many illiterate underachieving minority students exist. Rather than blame themselves or the many, many other factors, the California Board of Education has decided the answer is to lower the standards for education, eliminate standardized testing, ad advance class choices, lower admission standards, devalue education, dummy the students down, remove any measure of educational performance, including their own as educators, and 
national choice electives with a leftist ethnic studies curriculum, including charter schools, which incorporates critical race theory in multiple subjects as their answer. Mandatory in college, it's now approved for K-1 through 12. The only systemic racism in America is that of the anti-racist racist codifying the teaching of critical race theory and policies of a... Imagine class day one. Students, this is ethnic studies. Lesson one, all white people are racist. Always been racist. Will always be racist. So if you're white, you're a racist. And if you're brown, you're a victim of their oppressive racism. This country was founded on racism. And if you fail, it's someone else's fault, the racist. Math classes preach higher math is racist, grading is racist, achievement testing is racist, interest exams are racist, cops are racist, COVID is racist, and so forth. This cure is worse than the false narrative problem. They are teaching impressionable children to hate each other, cops, their country, and that minorities cannot succeed. Nowhere does parental family discipline to study, achieve, missing dads, or cultural differences get a mention to solve this disparity. Lowering standards, blaming whites, dumbing the students down. Eliminating merit testing isn't the answer. It's a race for the bottom. Leftists indoctrinators want to graduate anybody with the lowest common denominator pulse without measurement, but with mandatory regurgitation of all white people are racist. Mastery of anti-racist racism that is officially now approved public education. This divisive child indoctrination of gigantic lie of critical race theory is going to result in increasing racial tension. Thank you. Uh, next caller ending in eight three four six. Go ahead, please. Is this the time to comment on the CSSO? Next item. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, I am not seeing any other hands raised for oral communications. Again, this. This is for items that are not on our agenda tonight. Um, I do see a phone number ending in 1197. This is just for oral communications, which is not uh, for item number 35. Go ahead, please. Phone ending in 1197. If you press, press star six, you should be able to unmute and we're happy to hear you. I would like to know when. I would like to know when you are going to be um, having the meetings in person and when you are going to be extending the public comment as well as the comments. Um, that are made um, during oral communications or after any of the uh, the um, You have limited it to one minute. It used to be four minutes, five minutes. Some cities have unlimited amount of time. I'm not sure why it is one minute. It just shows that um, you are not interested in hearing from the public and what they have to say. So I would appreciate you having um, us back into the room or have the civic, which they have done in the past. And I'd appreciate if you could also have um, more time, I think at least three minutes per person, unless there's 50 or 100 people in line, then I could understand why it to maybe two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing other I, any other members in the public. Um, so we will go ahead and bring this back to um, to our next item. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, did you have a question? I did have a question. Maybe um, the city manager, city attorney, the, the member of the public. I was actually just thinking about this before the member of the public mentioned it, but I know the governor's lifting the. Um, where there's gonna be some changes to the mask order on June 15th. And I was just wondering if we're planning on going back to in-person meetings for the next council meeting, or is that gonna probably happen after July? Just so the members of the public have a sense, because if we're gonna go back to in-person meetings, I'm, I would imagine there's 
likely going to be some need to kind of make the public aware of that. Um, so right. Just thought I'd ask that question. Yeah, there's going to be a have, there's going to have to be a transition uh, plan prepared. The governor is lifting the mask order apparently effective uh, June 15th, but he, but he's not. All of the executive orders that have been issued, including the executive order that authorizes uh, uh, meetings to be conducted remotely. Followed and, by pound. And, um, and some mask restrictions will remain in effect, so we don't know exactly when the city is going to be required to return to in-person meetings, but uh, at least uh, soon and probably into August, um, the count, the, the city will be authorized to continue to con uh, remotely as um, we sort of feel our way forward on um, how the state is emerging from the, the infection rates. I mean, we're doing very well right now, um, um, but, it, but it remains to be seen how long that's, that's going to hold. And the governor has made it clear that the emergency executive orders relating to in-person meetings are, are going to remain in effect after the June 15th um, uh, lifting of the mask order. Uh, the only thing I can add to that is uh, I know that the discussions amongst the jurisdictions here locally in our county are kind of looking at August uh, as the time frame to come back to uh, in-person meetings. Great, thanks, those are all my questions. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that we have talked, um, we have had a meeting with city manager staff on, on sort of what this looks like and uh, our city clerk has been involved in that as well with regards to planning. So we're trying to figure it out based on the governor's direction. Okay. Um, okay, the next item on our agenda is going to be item number 35, which is the ordinance amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to camping services and standards. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please note, public comment will be limited to 30 minutes. Caller will have one minute to speak. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. For those who asked for extra time this evening, I'll be, we'll be um, letting you have three minutes each and I have four groups that have requested that. So I will go ahead and turn this over to Lee Butler, our Director of Planning, Community Development and Homeless Response. And um, Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, with this being a second reading this evening, I do not have a formal PowerPoint presentation, but I do have some general updates for you. And the committee, um, first, um, in the Council's May 11th action, um, there was a request that the ordinance be made publicly available for comments, and the ordinance was posted online following that meeting. Um, second, I wanted to give a few quick updates. Um, the first of those is that this is now the fifth time that the council has considered changes to the um, camping ordinance this year. And as part of um, many of those uh, deliberations and actions, the um, council's given direction, um, not just related to changes to the ordinance, but also um, with a wide range of other things, uh, things like um, coordination with the county, conducting a census, um, reporting back on how the ordinance is working, and a whole range of other items. I wanted to let the council and the community know that we'll be coming back to you on June 22nd with an update on um, a number of those items and where they're at. And a quick update for you, one of those directions was to release a request for qualifications to understand um, the scope of interest in um, organizations providing um, uh, the operational um, components of um, the safe sleeping or uh, managed encampments or shelter facilities 
And uh, we did release that last month and the um, responses, um, the initial round of responses, it's an ongoing RFQ, so there isn't a, a formal deadline. People can still submit, but we did request that the first um, responses come back to us by um, yesterday, and we have received responses from five separate organizations. So that's just a heads up. And we will provide um, a little bit more information to the council um, related to that on June 22nd, but those reports are due in two days. And so um, we're, we're not gonna have a full comprehensive analysis of all the, um, the RFQ responses um, at that point. <clears throat> and then um, finally, I just wanted to note for the council and the community that um, we've got 14 pages of ordinance language in front of you this evening, and um, a lot of that is new text. Um, we've worked very hard to um, get that wording right. Um, should the council adopt the ordinance tonight, we may still have future amendments that we bring to you. So if passed as we begin the implementation and as we hear from our stakeholder, as we learn about things that can be improved or clarified. Um, I just wanted to note that um, this is the fifth time it's been in front of you, but it may, it may not be the last. <laughs> it's, it's the last time it's in front of you this year um, if you adopt it this evening. And with that, I'm available for any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Lee. Yeah, I'll um, sort of chime in a little bit here as we start the conversation this evening. Um, I, I also tracked back um, through this, and it, this is our fifth time in hearing the ordinance. Um, we have had really good response to the RFQ, so um, this idea of inviting our community and the, the qualified nonprofits to help us uh, up some of the, um, the services that we're committing to um, through this ordinance, um, obviously we're well received. I think we've had a lot of talk about how we need to get other folks involved. And obviously, um, you know, when we made the motion to include the request for qualifications and proposals from qualified, we've seen those responses. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, uh, and we also have seen um, a lot of support for the ordinance. Um, I did wanna make a note just to the public, uh, rather than bringing this uh, ordinance back in two weeks, which we could have done, um, we went ahead and extended this um, and gave a full month between meetings so that um, additional public outreach, additional time for people to read the ordinance was made available. Um, we did uh, sessions regarding the request for proposal and obviously city staff and I'm sure council members were in contact with folks if they had questions. So. Um, I do feel like we've done a lot of uh, outreach again, um, you know, drafting and, and completing an ordinance is a public process. It is, um, you know, we all of us have touched this ordinance now with different amendments and um, uh, I am very pleased that we're here tonight and, um, you know, I feel like it's, a, it's an important decision to try to operationalize this ordinance um, as soon as we can. So I will go ahead and uh, open it up to council members for questions regarding uh, anything for staff at this point. Okay, seeing any questions from the council, I'll go ahead and take this out for public comment. And I do have um, four members who are, have made a request for extra time. So I'll go ahead and start with Westside Cares. You have three minutes. Westside Cares Neighborhood Group is urging the council to reject the Camping Services and Standards Ordinance. We also wish to uplift the messages found in the letters from the ACLU and Disability Rights California regarding this ordinance. Research demonstrates time and time again that punitive and criminalizing reactions to people experiencing homelessness are expensive, ineffective, and harmful for our entire community. So is a summary of our actual research about the effects of camping bans and why we are so strongly opposed to CSSO. Camping bans are marketed as a way to prioritize outreach and services. However, research shows that when these types of laws are passed, the increase in services tends not to materialize, but fines, citations, and arrests increase. 
When shelters continue to be overburdened and affordable housing not available, people break the law by either sheltering in public and risking harassment from police or finding more isolated and hidden locations to avoid moving camp daily. This perpetuates the cycle of homelessness. Camping bans worsen public health by dispersing people and their belongings to more remote areas of the city with nowhere to discard trash or bodily waste while also making it difficult and to provide services that could mitigate these issues. Disbanding, disbanding encampments further worsens public health by making it more difficult to access stable shelter, increasing fights, attacks, and theft. These assaults were notably compounded along lines of race, gender, disability, and sexual identity. The nature of having to pick up and move every single day is a well-documented documented destabilizing force in people's lives. Even if police are tasked with outreach for Merely having frequent contact with law enforcement is detrimental to unhoused people. According to one researcher, when anti-homeless laws are enacted, homeless individuals have continual interactions with law enforcement that are designed to punish, even if they don't lead to arrest. This creates a never-ending cycle of homelessness, inflicting material and psychological harm, while deepening racial, gender, and health inequalities among the urban poor. This is termed pervasive penalty. Using the criminal justice system and other municipal resources to move people who have nowhere else to go is costly and counterproductive for both communities and individuals. Instead of focusing on proactive and productive solutions, this ordinance will funnel more money into the already bloated budget of SDPD, one of whose employees received over $75,000 in overtime in 2019. This is not efficient use of our tax dollars. At the last council discussion of this ordinance, council members discussed the importance of preventing people from losing their homes. We agree that this is important, but how can we believe that the council takes this seriously when you voted in favor of taking steps towards building a luxury hotel in downtown parking lot instead of prioritizing affordable housing? We can't believe what you say because we see what you do. There is no reason for us, your constituents, to believe the promised services in this ordinance will actually materialize in a way that benefit, benefits the majority of people experiencing houselessness. Criminalizing people who choose not to engage in offered services for any reason is cruel and counterproductive. We'll have a from what health care is finishing up with this because the time is so limited. Thank you. Thank you. Next up um, for extra time will be Serge. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Serge. Okay. Um, I just want to make it something, a quick point. Um, uh, yesterday, I talked to the Coastal Commission, um, the representative in Santa Cruz. Um, as probably all of you guys know, Coastal Act um, has jurisdiction over the coastal zone, somewhat like half mile from the ocean. Um, and any development or access to the coastal zone um, is their purview. And we have a local uh, coastal plan. And uh, I was told yesterday that the coast, the, this ordinance, since it does affect people and their access to the coastal zone, needs an amendment to our lo local coastal plan before implementation, or we will be out of compliance of our of the coastal act open to and as much as we've just had a whole lot of budget hearings on how uh, financially strapped and less programs we have we'll be open to uh, lawsuit and the coastal act also says that anyone who sues a jurisdiction and wins uh, on a uh, out of compliance issue for the coastal zone can have their legal fees paid for so so far, we've been sued a few times um, by the homeless union. Um, I don't think they've had the uh, incentive to actually have their legal fees paid for. Um, it is uh, the seventh, whereas on the first, bottom of the first page makes it very clear that we actually are trying to access limit to access, uh, limiting access to the coastal zone. The end of that sentence says, without a camping prohibition, the city is perceived as attracting ever more unsheltered people to a highly desirable community without the ability to provide adequate services to them, which proclaims pretty clearly we're trying to limit access to the coastal zone. So I just want to put that out there. I really would 
prefer that our city stop spending money on legal defenses of things that aren't really defendable. Um, and also put out the Arana Gulch needs a separate amendment to the local coastal plan. Um, I've had this question, this up before in city council, um, and Lee Butler can probably talk about this a little bit more. He was on the emails with the uh, Coastal Commission. Okay, thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Next up, I have uh, Robert Norse for extra time. Robert, are you here this evening? I've got Robert Norse for extra time on item number 35. Okay, I'll move on to um, the new Houseless Coalition for extra time on item number 35. Go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll start. I don't know who, I don't know if Mr. Norse or the new Santa Cruz Houseless Coalition has a phone number. I'm not sure who to unmute. Right. Uh, if the person representing the new Houseless Coalition could unraise your hand momentarily. Um, I think if you want, Mayor, I'm okay. If you want to just proceed and then if we get to those two, I'll just change the time to three. That's good, good idea. Okay. Okay, um, for those listening, if Robert Norris or the New Houses Coalition is in the uh, queue here in our meeting attendees, we'll, um, we'll have you, we'll go ahead and give you that three minutes. So I'll move on to um, our regular time um, and I will call on Tom Brown. Great, good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna thank the City Council again for the careful and thoughtful consideration of what is really just an intractable issue. Uh, it, uh, I'm speaking when I perceive right strong. Uh, we appreciate the Commission's willingness to reconsider the original uh, and I think poorly conceived ordinance. Uh, the result we have in front of the Council tonight I think is well balanced uh, in its approach to address our homelessness issue and a, a good result, uh, especially from where we started. So uh, short, sweet, thank you. Uh, I think it's work well done and uh, very much appreciated by Seabright Strong. Thank you. Next up is Skirt. Um, hello, council, council members. Um, so this is Skirt. Um, you know, I served an internship with the ACLU a bunch of years ago. Um, I worked as a paralegal. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an admin assistant with a special district here in the county. And it's really clear to me that this ought to be sued um, if you engage in this action. Um, I think it's pretty uh, likely that a civil rights lawsuit will be lodged. Um, you know, I'm an engaged citizen. I'm a former Santa Cruz Derby girl. I love this town. Um, I'm, a, I'm a wife. I'm a homeowner. I plan to be in Santa Cruz a long time. So I just say that although I feel anger at you and at, I'm sorry, at many of you who have been supportive of this ordinance, um, I'm not here to criticize you. I'm here to help you. If I could have like 30 more seconds. Yeah. I'm here to help you. Is this real? Is that really how you want to spend the next few years of your term of service in a civil rights lawsuit for discriminating against disabled people? Um, really hope that you think about what that's going to feel like one year from now. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 8346.
Hi, I'm calling uh, in as, as a representative of Westside Cares to pick up where they uh, were cut off. Um, I'd like to start with a quote from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Quote, the forced dispersal of people from encampment settings is not an appropriate solution or strategy. It accomplishes nothing toward the goal of linking people to permanent housing opportunities and can make it more difficult to provide such lasting solutions to people who have been sleeping and living in the encampment, end quote. Productive evidence-based solutions that Westside Care supports and criminalization are as follows. According to the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, quote, in order to end homelessness, we must link people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, including those who live in encampments with permanent housing opportunities matched with the right level of services to ensure that those housing opportunities are stable and successful, end quote. In order to work towards this goal, we would like to see at least 25% of the Santa Cruz Police Department budget reinvested into permanent supportive housing and or support services for those who live in encampments. In a, 2000, in a 2019 internal survey of SCPD, it was estimated that 80% of calls for service are related to homelessness. Investing money into housing solutions instead of criminalizing ordinances proven to save a significant amount of money for cities in the long term, particularly in law enforcement and health care costs. Thank you very much. Next up, we have um, phone number ending in 4844. Uh, can you hear me? Go ahead, Mr. Norris. Yeah, most of the arguments that Westside Cares have made, of course, are very pertinent and to the point, but they need to be brought up in lawsuits and in on-ground action in support of actual homeless people living in survival encampments. You are clearly, you, the city council, are not listening and aren't interested and have your own prefabricated agenda. It seems to have been cooked up by Mills and the staff. You need to, the community listening who cares about this needs to work through groups like SOS, the Homeless Union, Food Not Bombs, Nomad, DSA, Cop Watch, Huff, other groups. I, I haven't mentioned everyone, but it has to be direct action that for the injunction that you are currently, the taxpayers are paying for because the city attorney and the city manager are foolish enough to engage in their activities in the midst of winter and still in the midst of the COVID crisis. It's a ridiculous uh, situation where the homeless where people cannot even finish their comments here with this ridiculous bell dinging. You you have plenty of time to give to this if you wish aren't, and you actually have plenty of time to go to homeless service providers and homeless people. You spent a whole year with Catch and you ignored their resolutions. You've removed all specific locations from the ordinance, giving full power to the city manager to set things up, which is, I think, an attempt to hornswoggle even those who favor harsher camping laws. Various groups who have who've urged you to, you know, criminalize homeless camping citywide because they, you can simply then just, by not having a specific location, you give people the illusion that they won't have homeless people in their neighborhoods. That's not the case. You know that's not the case. You aren't providing any specifics about services, and instead it's about restrictions. So again, contact the people who really care about this, who will really act on this, and people actually have to do something to take action to stop the kind of abuses that the city police is being directed to do uh, through your agency. Uh, I encourage people to do that, and I remind you that you uh, violated the Brown Act this morning by not providing information in the case of Eric Price homeless activist who reported being assaulted by the police as a member of the homeless union, yet you went ahead and considered his claim without providing the specifics on the agenda for that. So that's a real pity. Uh, it should be the basis for another lawsuit. And if anybody wants to do that, I'd be happy to join on to it. Thank you, okay, I'm not seeing any other um, in the in the audience. Oh, here we go. One eight one zero, please. Hey, yeah, this care so. Hey, as usual, the communists come out in force when the subject is homelessness. They have no problem with unlimited numbers of homeless here. They like to enrage those dissatisfied 
is to justify anti-American values promoting anti-American politics. I've said it many times before, I need to say it all again. I actually am willing to support this, but it needs evaluation every year or so to see if it actually reduces homelessness in the city or actually increases it. The unholy alliance between the homeless industrial complex and the government hasn't worked so far. I'm skeptical what happens when the camps fill up or adding homeless services in the city limits permanently subsidizing homelessness with no real path out of it as far as just providing shelter, which might just make it worse. Uh, and I do recognize it's a hugely difficult problem. Any increase is a failure. I'm curious about those closed session leases of so many parcels at the harbor. Homeless camp? Uh, what, you're going to leave us later what it was for? I think a compromise between banning camping permanently in some areas and leaving other areas. Okay, I guess that's my time, huh? Okay, bye. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands in the audience, so I'll go ahead and bring it back to council and uh, see what we've got. Sorry, I lost my. I see um, Councilmember Watkins has her hand raised. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you to the community members who've been engaged and are with us this evening to speak to us on this item. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about this at length, and as was said before, I don't think this will be the last time we're going to be talking about this, but I also really feel passionately about moving forward with uh, action and continuing to try to pursue solutions to learn from what works and to make adjustments from what we learn along the way. And um, with that, I know we're at a second reading at this point, so to kind of keep the um, kind of the conversation in the policy direction moving, I'm happy to start by moving the re recommendation um, to, let's see, consider the second reading and final adoption of the ordinance number 2021-12, amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code relating to camping services and standards. Thank you, and I will look to see other hands. I see Council Member Kalantari Johnson, Kalantari Johnson, I'm sorry, my, uh, my, my <laughs> and also I saw Vice uh, Mayor Bruner's hand go up. Council Member. Great, thank you, and I'll um, go ahead and second Council Member Watkins' motion. Um, and I just wanted to comment that um, a lot of work has been put into this. Um, we've been talking about it way before February, but um, this iteration and, and uh, with the public since February. Um, and I appreciate the, um, the efforts by the team and the staff to engage the public and the community throughout this process. I have also reached out to service providers and really trying to um, understand how what we're offering through this ordinance will be aligned with um, what homeless service providers and public health providers are doing in the community, as well as what the county is doing. So I'm hopeful that this is um, this will be a piece of the larger holistic um, puzzle that our community is trying to put forward uh, in an effort to address this um, devastating in our community. So um, with that, I'll, I'll let others speak, let other council members speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have your hand up? I saw it pop up for a moment. I was going to second the motion that council member Watkins had made and- um, I'm sorry, uh, I wasn't sure if you were commenting or I'm sorry, but okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, one of the things we've gotten to is a point of um, where we've really got the, the operations and addressing um, some of the direction that we've implemented from the beginning in this process with the ordinance. And um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing this continue to move forward and to continue to evaluate. I, um, I believe it was Garrett Phillips um, 
you know, was mentioning the annual evaluation. Um, and so I think we just need to begin. And this is where we've landed through uh, a lot of process and dialogue and conversations. And um, it's addressing for the first time, we're really making steps as a city to address some of these impacts within this ordinance. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's it for my comment. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor. Uh, uh, Council Member Cumming. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did want to ask a question um, first from city staff about um, the comments that were made by Serge regarding the ordinance and the Coastal Commission. So I was just wondering if you all would be able to comment on that. Sure, I'll, I'll take a first crack at it and see if Tony wants to add anything. Um, so we did identify um, our uh, some of our perspectives as part of the report that came to the council on um, May 11th. Um, we have had communications with the Coastal Commission. It's uh, clear to us that it is a LCP amendment. Um, it could ultimately be an LCP amendment. Um, you know, we will continue if, if the council chooses to um, adopt the ordinance, we will engage in further conversations with the Coastal Commission um, and get to an understanding about whether that um, actually is an LCP amendment and the implications of that in terms of um, the, the council's actions and um, what needs to happen in front of the Coastal Commission if so. But you'll see in the May 11th ordinance that you know, we coordinated with our attorneys and um, we've um, uh, conveyed some perspectives to the Coastal Commission uh, whereby um, we're not as clear that it is an LCPA. And I, I think um, should the council move forward with this tonight, then we'll have a, a specific ordinance to discuss with the Coastal Commission and come to a, a final determination on the status as it relates to uh, local coastal program amendment or not. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd have to add to that is that, um, can you hear me by the way? Cause I'm, um, yeah, the two options, well, there are three. One is, is this development as defined by the Coastal Act a change in the <clears throat> density or the intensity of the use of land or water? Uh, I think arguably not because um, this ordinance really just continues provisions of 636 of the Muni Code that were in effect prior to the Martin versus Boise decision. So from a legislative standpoint, it doesn't amount to a significant change in the law uh, as, um, as the Coastal Act defines development. Um, and then I think uh, planning director is correct that we need to take a look at whether or not this is an LCPA, an amendment to the local coastal program, or um, is a coastal development permit application required in order to implement the ordinance? I haven't heard from the Coastal Commission that they view that um, as a requirement, but um, I think we're open to discussions with the Coastal Commission and uh, we'll evaluate any comments that they have and and recommend any appropriate actions based on those uh, communications uh, when they take that position. And Mr. Cagno is right that a, uh, a prevailing plaintiff in a lawsuit alleging a coastal act violation is entitled to recover uh, prevailing plaintiff attorney season costs. Um, you know, the key word there is prevailing. So, um, you know, we certainly take those kinds of claims seriously and evaluate them carefully as we move forward with the implementation of uh, council policy. And then a follow-up question, I guess, um, you know, given the fact that it sounds like there's gonna be, there's a need to have some review of this by the Coastal Commission or conversations, would it make sense to have those first before passing something? Because if my question is, you know, if we pass something and if, I, if we're in violation, and you know, somebody files a lawsuit, it's, you can't really backpedal from that. So and our, curious about that. our experience has been when the Coastal Commission feels that it's important to weigh in on the issue, even though 
the, the traditional mechanism for the Coastal Commission's purview over uh, local government decisions is on an appeal. Um, the Coastal Commission has um, weighed in before a decision is made by the City Council. So the fact that the Coastal Commission, knowing that this ordinance uh, is before you, um, obviously having been uh, receiving communications from members of the public about it and not having weighed in at this point to the City Council suggests that it's probably not a critical item for the Coastal Commission, but if um, the Commission does reach out, um, we can certainly bring Council's attention before any significant you know, implementation activities are, are undertaken. So I don't see that as the, the basis for not moving forward at this time. Yeah, I would, I would just add that um, it is, we still, as the council knows, um, the way the ordinance is structured, um, implementation will not occur until certain things are in place. Um, storage facilities, the safe sleeping sites and so forth. And we still have some work to do. To, to get those things up and running. So I do anticipate coordination with the Coastal Commission um, in the very near future should council um, choose to adopt the ordinance this evening. And um, if there are um, additional steps that are needed, then we would seek to accomplish those in advance of actually implementing the ordinance. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll just make my final comments on this because we've discussed this a lot. And, you know, my biggest concern, and the biggest concerns that I've been hearing from the community has largely been around the process, which many people have expressed to me has been rushed and uh, people have not felt included. Um, I've tried to advocate members of the community who've reached out, so I want to thank you all for contacting me, um, largely so that we could create a clear and transparent process. Um, but, um, you know, we continue to push this through rapidly and um, and many and even today we're hearing about how this might need to have more input from the Coastal Commission and many people have felt this has been a very rushed process. Um, and the, a lot of the people I've been in contact with have been supportive of a lot of the aspects of the ordinance where, they, where we've landed on today. Um, but as I mentioned before, many of them have felt that um, because they haven't been included and their voices have, haven't been included, and a lot of the parts of this process that, you know, they, they don't feel that uh, there's a lot of hope around their voices being included and they've, they've been feeling really bad about not being included in this process from the beginning. And, you know, these aren't just activists, they're lawyers, parents, homeowners, professionals, retirees, teachers, renters, and I could go on. Um, and so I'm just gonna express on their behalf that I'll be voting no on this ordinance. Um, I do support the services that we're bringing forward, and many of these people do as well. And many people do, who I've been in contact with, understand the need to address the issues, you know, keeping large encampments from forming, and also trying to, uh, you know, manage those impacts. But um, a lot of them have felt that along the way that this has been very rushed, and as a result, they, their voices haven't been included. And so those are my statements, and I'll end there. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Clonter Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would just echo uh, the comments made by Council Member Cummings uh, with respect to hearing from community uh, and the breadth uh, within the community that we've heard from uh, of, in, in opposition to this. Uh, this particular route to addressing our uh, challenges with our unhoused community members. Uh, I'm not gonna give a big speech about all the reasons that I am uh, concerned about it and can't support it. Uh, I think I've made that pretty clear and there's not much percentage in uh, saying it one more time. Uh, but I do wanna raise the concern about the, uh, the potential legal costs uh, that we are, this vote will <laughs> potentially take us into. Um, and and I, I see that in uh, reflected in, in letters that we've received. I see that and I hear that in uh, discussions that I've heard about going on in the community. And, uh, you know, I just think we're, um, 
it's a big risk, and I understand that my colleagues want to take that risk. Um, but I think, given that, it's it's quite important that we uh, develop some mechanism for uh, tracking uh, and you know doing some analysis of how much this costs us in legal fees uh, to to be continuing to do an enforcement only uh, approach. And um, I, I realize we're not doing an enforcement only approach this particular time, but that has been the case every other time that we've discussed this. So, uh, you know, we, we're doing a little better here, but I don't think that gets us out of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the legal risk zone. Uh, uh, you know, I'll leave it there in terms of my concerns, but I would ask my colleagues to please consider uh, including some uh, direction to uh, ask for tracking of legal costs related to um, this ordinance and our approach to uh, homelessness response. Unfortunately, we won't have a baseline uh, to work from because we have never tracked this. Um, and I and I want to thank uh, Tony Condotti for raising it. That you know he's trying to work on finding ways to do that. But I think it's incumbent upon uh, those who uh, want to see this ordinance implemented to ask for that information. And I, I certainly would would want to see that in the you know first reporting that comes back to us um, uh, in terms of progress reporting. Thank you, Council Member. I have Council Member Colantari Johnson, then Council Member Boulder, and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you. Yes, I just um, needed to respond to my colleagues' comments around the community process. Uh, We've mentioned before that, that, that we've taught as a community, as a council, we've talked about, not this council, but other councils have talked about homelessness for years now. Um, and yes, not all of the, the recommendations by the catch have been put forward, and some of them have. Um, we've been, with this council, talking about this um, addressing homelessness through an ordinance since February, and there have been many opportunities for communities to participate. Um, I've also taken the steps to reach out to community members, both in favor and in opposition, um, truly listening and integrating um, their voices and perspectives in what we have brought forward and what I have brought forward. Um, a lot of the services and the shape of what the services should look like have come from folks in, in the um, home providers world um, that have helped shape that. Um, I've been hearing from a lot of community members from both sides, and I've been hearing from a lot of community members that want to see action and that want us to, want us to move forward with something that helps mitigate the negative impacts of encampments and that helps move um, solutions and services forward. Uh, it's really difficult to make these votes. Uh, you know, I have been very conflicted. I have worked in the homelessness world and I have been on both sides and. Um, it, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to make the vote. Um, and ultimately, we have to do it in order to move forward. Uh, ultimately, it is about community well-being. And I know that some folks out there um, don't believe that this is the way forward for community well-being. Um, I believe it is. I believe we're moving forward with solutions. Um, I know that, that some, some folks out there don't trust this process. Um, but I will just say for myself as an individual who really cares about this issue, who's worked on the issue, um, I'm gonna make sure that our county staff and our city move forward with the services that we have committed to. Um, I'm committing to that right now publicly in front of everyone, and I'm ready to make the hard vote. So that's all, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Golder. I, I'd like to echo what my um, colleague, Councilman, uh, Councilman Calentari Johnson said, and I just have to say, all seven of us have every street in town and gone door to door and talked to people, and I would argue that one of the top three concerns of, maybe, maybe top five, but top three for me, of every citizen in town was homelessness. And I've walked through homeless encampments with some of you, I've walked through homeless encampments with staff, and I don't think this is a perfect solution. I'm not gonna pretend that it is, but I think we're at a point where we have to do something. And 
I definitely think the community has had plenty of opportunity to get involved. We've definitely implemented um, aspects of the catch. We've listened and revised, and I'm definitely ready to move forward. And I understand um, Council Member Brown and Council Member Cummings' concerns around the legal risk. And I just have to say the most illuminating thing for me from being on council thus far has been how many people sue the city. We get sued for everything, literally everything, I feel like. And so if we didn't do something because we were worried about that, I don't think we would get ever. And so unfortunately, I agree with you guys. I do think we probably will get sued, but that's a risk I'm willing to take because I think it's really important. And um, yeah, that's where I am at. Okay, thank you, council member. I have council member Watkins. Um, Thank you, Mayor. And I just, I think I, I too just want to extend one, my appreciation and gratitude to you for the extensive community outreach that you did to refine and to bring revisions and to hear the voices of the community in regards to the concerns, which has led to, yes, not a perfect uh, proposal, but a community and and I do really uh, share that it's very difficult to take these votes. It's very, very difficult to take risk, even though it's calculated. And um, and what it's worse, though, for me is to do nothing or to continue to postpone and to have no decision and no action, even if there's things that we're not gonna get right and there's things that we are gonna get right, but we're gonna keep moving because we wanna hear solutions. and. I, um, I struggle with that not being enough process as well in regards to one, just the, the time I've been on council and I know it's been a contentious and challenging issue for, for many, many years in this community. Um, and we've had a, a number of ad hoc committees and uh, community committees formed and making these tough decisions is always a really tough part. And I, um, I just acknowledge every single one of my colleagues where I believe that we completely share a commitment to want to see solutions move forward. And as imperfect as they may be, being in action is our job and making tough decisions is our job. And so I really stand by that and recognize that it's gonna be a process of continuous improvement as is and as should be everything in, in my opinion. We're always learning and growing as people, as government, as community, and aspiring to have a healthy community for everybody. So that I, I do agree and that um, you know we, ha we have balanced process and now it's time for action. And that brought us here this evening after many, many meetings, many, many hours of public input and community input and opportunity for community input, either us going to the community or them coming to us. And in regards to, I think, a lot of the legal challenges, I, I share that we have a very litigious, it's a litigious environment. And, um, you know, by not doing anything also engages us in, lit in litigious litigation as well, right? In terms of the issues that we see bringing us to federal courts and dealing with large encampments once they're formed. So I'm hopeful that moving forward with solutions at the forefront will bring uh, this issue to uh, some pathway to uh, seeing more people having healthier lives in our community. So with that, I am prepared to move forward as we're uh, proposing this evening with the second reading. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Brown, did you have another statement? Yeah, I just, sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing that I, I, I kind of forgot, which is, I think it's very important, and, and I'm really doing this on, on behalf of the many people who I've spoken with who have concerns about an, another uh, risk, uh, likely much greater, uh, and that is the fire potential, because what we know is that we displace large numbers of people from our uh, um, the parts of town that are not fire prone out you know inside the city, um, they people go into the Pogo Net, people go into Sycamore Grove, and I recognize that we have a very capable and committed and uh, you know uh, city staff who are going to work very hard to prevent that. 
Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're talking about not having resources to pick up uh, all the trash. So it's hard for me to imagine that we're going to have the resources to uh, constantly, per, you know, perpetually keep people out of fire-prone areas for, for and setting up encampments. We've heard it since the clearance of Highway 1 and 9 from our neighbors uh, up the river who are exper now experiencing uh, more impact and um, and they're really worried. Uh, I think that's just going to um, kind of get uh, even more difficult as the the season goes on. And you know, I just want to just remind us that that is where people will go. Uh, they're not just going to disappear. And um, so, and I don't. Uh, say any of this to suggest that my colleagues don't care about or want you know want to make people's lives worse. I, I recognize that we're all trying to do something uh, that we think is going to um, help address the issues. Um, I, I want to see us move forward on those pieces to act in ways that uh, some of those services and spaces uh, that that make people's lives better and more stable. Uh, rather than the actions that keep people moving around um, in instability and, um, you know, moving into places that are hidden uh, so, as, so as to not be um, ticketed and potentially uh, jailed. So I just wanted to add that. I, I've heard it from so many people. I think it's really important that we talk about that and we, we understand that uh, we have, it's going to, it's going to be a, a different uh, uh, situation uh, once we have more, you know, the more people moving in, and it's, you know, it's just is what it is. Um, but I'm I'm saying it because I hear it as a concern, a real fear, um, and I share that. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have additional comments? I just said. Uh, one last comment that came up that I forgot to make, um, which was I really just um, also, well, one, want to thank uh, everyone who's weighed in on, um, but I do just want to also express that I, I, I do want the community to understand that, um, that we're not creating, um, you know, any false expectations around what's going to be happening. Homelessness is a very difficult subject, and the passing of this ordinance is not going to make, you know, all of our issues disappear overnight. And so... Um, there's going to be a lot of ongoing discussion around how to mitigate these impacts. I, this is going to take, you know, more time, and I'm just hoping that as this continues to, to move forward and as we learn more, that we can create um, more opportunities and processes for people to engage and feel like that they're, um, you know, being reached out to before major decisions are being made. Um, I know that <clears throat> this has been before since February, but one of the reasons why we're still here today is because um, many people felt like they were left out of the conversation when this was approved, when the second reading was approved the previous time, and we were, you know, going to be allowing for um, sleeping in, when facilities were full in industrial spaces. And, you know, that was one of the things that people were really concerned about, along with also saying that it was, you know, okay for people to sleep in our open space. Those, are the, those people who live around those areas felt like they were not a part of that conversation. And I think when we're dealing with major topics like homelessness, um, you know, that we tr try to do our best to create, be transparent at the outset um, versus having people, going to people after we've already began making the decisions that impact their neighborhoods. Um, I, I totally agree that all of us are very much committed to homelessness and trying to help people who are experiencing homelessness, but we also have said that we're committed to creating an inclusive and equitable process for how we make decisions. And I think that we need to make sure that we are committed to that as we're making decisions moving forward. And so, um, and then also want to express, you know, to the extent we can continue having a productive and positive relationship with the county and finding ways to collaborate with them moving forward is really going to be critical for us to be able to make sure that these programs are successful. And so um, I'm, I will continue to be engaged. And although I'm, you know, not going to be supporting uh, what's before us tonight. That I am uh, committed as well to addressing homelessness and trying to find solutions and working with the community as this moves forward. Thank you, Council Member. I am not seeing any additional hands up with Council Members, so I will go ahead. Um, we have a, a motion on the floor by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. 
um, to consider the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2021-12, amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to camping services and standards. And I would ask um, Bonnie to, to do a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? No. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes with five in favor and two against. And that is our last item of the evening. And so we will be adjourning um, until our June 22nd meeting. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and please have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye.